Check, check, loud check. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all. Uh, myself, Suman Pant, uh, currently affiliated to Nepal Health Research Council in the capacity of research officer. We wish to express our sincere gratitude to you all for being here with us today uh, in this second session of this historic event organized by the Nepal Health Research Council. It is our proud privilege to welcome you all in the biomedical, epidemiological, and clinical research session. One of the key event of the summit, primarily focusing the recent findings in the medical clinical research sector in Nepal context, followed by a presentation and discussion 
entitled Clinicians as Researchers, Challenges and Opportunities by our eminent speaker, Professor Dr. Mohan Raj Sarma. At the outset, I'm delighted to welcome and invite Professor Dr. Janak Khoirala to the podium to chair and moderate the session. <laughs> to briefly introduce Professor Khoirala, he is the Professor of Medicine and Infectious Disease at Patan Academy of Health Sciences and Clinical Research Consultant at Nepal Health Research Council. He is a Professor Emeritus of Medicine and Infectious Diseases at the Southern LNS University School of Medicine, United States, where he worked for more than 20 years and returned to Nepal two years ago. He is also an adjunct professor at University of Illinois at Chicago. He obtained his bachelor's degree in medicine and surgery from Tribune University Institute of Medicine in 1991. Dr. Khoirala has over 20 years experience and expertise of clinical research and has led multiple clinical research projects in the States as principal investigator, including uh, in HIV antibiotic resistance, myobacteria, and hepatitis C. He has over 50 peer reviewed scientific publications and numerous original research abstract published. He has given scientific presentations at national and international meetings. He is a fellow of American College of Physicians and a fellow of Infectious Disease Society of America. He is currently serving as an executive member of the Global Health Committee for Infectious Disease Society of America. Welcome, Professor Koirala. Moving on, it is my enormous delight to welcome and invite uh, Professor Dr. Paras Kumar Pokhrel to co-chair the session. Uh, he has a medical degree in general and community medicine. He is currently professor and a chief of School of Public Health and Community Medicine at the BP Koirala Institute of Health Sciences. The institute located in the eastern Nepal has extensive outreach health programs towards the primary health care centers. He has started the environmental and occupational health department at SPH and CM and strongly advocates for basic occupational health services for all, for all workers in all the sectors. He advocates the regional need of working together to improve public health academia and practice in the region. He worked as a regional technical advisor, WHO Southeast Asia Advisory Committee on Health Research. He has one year experience of working as the chair of Department of Community Medicine and Family Practice at Kathmandu University School of Medical Sciences during its establishment phase at Dulikhil. Welcome, Professor Dr. Paras Kumar Pokhrel. <laughs> Moving on, uh, it's, it's, it's my again proud privilege to invite uh, to the podium Professor Dr. Saraj Prasad Oza. He is the professor and head of department at Department of Psychiatry, TUTH. Uh, he is an immediate past president at Nepal Epilepsy Society, past president of Psychiatric Association of Nepal, past vice president of Nepal Medical Association, and past president of AMDA Nepal. He has published over 45 articles in the peer-reviewed journal. He has been the principal investigator of National Mental Health Survey of Nepal, in the year 2020, and he has co-authored Mental Health System in Nepal, published by the World Health Organization and Ministry of Health and Population in 2007. He has also contributed for two book chapters in postgraduate psychiatry. He has developed national training curriculum on OST approved by Ministry of Health and Population. He has supervised over 25 postgraduate MD psychiatry and MPhil, clinical psychology thesis for Tribune University and two PhD thesis for University of Oslo, Norway. He is also acting as a commissioner for Nepal NCDI Poverty Commission, involved in international research collaborations, such as contextualization and validation study of PTGI scale in Nepal, supported by Yokohama City Hospital, Japan. He is also actively involved in teaching learning activities of undergraduate, postgraduate students for more than 20 years and capacity building training for medical doctors, lawyers, judges, and paramedics in Nepal. Welcome, Professor Dr. Saraj Prasadoza, to the podium. as a panelist of the session. So moving on, uh, let's applaud uh, Dr. Avinab Baidia uh, to the podium. He is the professor of community medicine. He holds bachelor's degree in medicine from Bangladesh in 2000, uh, MD in community medicine from BPKHS in 2006, and PhD in medical sciences from Gothenburg University, Sweden in 2014. 
Besides academics, he has been involved in NCD-related research, policy development projects, advocacy, and health promotion. He is a lone scholar in cardiovascular health at Harvard Chichan School of Public Health. He functions as the member secretary of Nepal NCD Alliance and a governing board member of SEER NCD Alliance. He has led teams that worked on development of basic health services package and emergency healthcare package for the Ministry of Health and Population, Government of Nepal. He is Senior Vice President of Nepalese Society of Community Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Abhinav. <laughs> Moving on, uh, it's my enormous pleasure to invite Dr. Amit Joshi to the podium as a panelist. He is a renowned arthroscopy surgeon in the country and is currently professor at Keist Medical College and senior arthroscopy consultant at BNB Hospital. He pursued his fellowship in arthroscopy and sports injury from India and USA and has been actively involved in arthroscopy surgery since 2007 with experience of over 10,000 arthroscopic surgeries. He has over 70 publications and many under review. Dr. Joshi is a well-known clinical researcher he has written several chapters on arthroscopy and published three books. He has published more than 75%, uh, 75 research papers in national and international journals. He has been a national and international faculty at various famous arthroscopy conferences. Welcome, Dr. Josie. So, uh, similarly, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Prabhat Adhikari to the podium as a panelist for this session. He is an infectious disease and critical care consultant who has been practicing in both Nepal and the USA with keen research interest on antimicrobial resistance, tuberculosis, COVID-19, HIV, and ARDS, amongst others. Dr. Adhikari has been leading some research projects in Nepal, most notably the multi-site phase three clinical trial of favipiravir among mild to moderate COVID-19 cases in Nepal. He is also providing his expertise to NSRC, where he has been key in formulation of clinical trial guidelines and advocating for promotion of clinical research in Nepal. Dr. Adhikari is, a leading, is also leading a research organization entitled NEPZEN, which is dedicated to conducting clinical research, training of manpower, building of electronic data phases, etc. Dr. Adhikari is also keen on the use of IT and artificial intelligence in the medical sector and research. In collaboration with software engineers and data scientists, he has established a medical IT organization called DAFE Center, where his team has developed an electronic health record system, electronic case report form, electronic trial, master file, etc., and thus working on creation of a central online database which will be useful in conducting clinical research, developing clinical decision support tools, and providing platform for artificial intelligence. Welcome, Dr. Adhikari. The other term of this session is that uh, uh, we have international panelists in the session. Uh, we applaud uh, our kind uh, you know, we apply to a kind of positive considerations in joining us uh, today despite short notice. Our sincere apologies for the inconvenience created due to the delays in organizing this session. So I'd like to uh, introduce a prominent scholar, Pro, uh, Professor Jeremy Day, who is joining us from the UK right now to us. Professor Jeremy Day has been in Vietnam since 2003, running and developing a clinical and basic science research program in the central nervous system infections, opportunistic infections, and HIV. The work of the group encompasses bacterial meningitis, tuberculosis, meningitis, encephalitis, cryptococcal disease, penicilliosis, and HIV as primary CNS pathogens, and has contributed to international guidelines on disease management. Dr. Jeremy's particular interest is a uh, cryptocopal disease in both HIV infected and uninfected patients. His research is based on large multicenter trials, including recruiting across Asia and Africa. In addition to improving treatment, his work focused on better understanding the ecology of neoformance and the determinants of its pathogenicity. Dr. Day has published over 40 articles in international journals, and he is also the investigator in the uh, randomized evaluation of COVID-19 therapy that's being implemented in Nepal currently. Similarly, I'm, I'm privileged to introduce Professor Bala Venkatesh uh, as an international panelist for this session. He is a professor of intensive care medicine at the University of Queensland, a preeminent 
specialist in the intensive care medicine at the Princess Alexandra Hospital and deputy director of intensive care medicine at the Wesley Hospital. He is also the president of College of the Intensive Care Medicine. He is the principal investigator of the NHMRC funded multi center international adrenal trial, and his research interests include glucocorticosteroid physiology in the critical illness, including the development of the idea of sick youth adrenal state, sepsis, and vitamin D in critical illness. He also pioneered the development of continuous blood gas monitoring system. He supervises three PhD students and has been the recipient of several grants from the foundations and industry. And he's also the investigator for ESCOT ADAPT trial and is being implemented in TUTH and Beard Hospital currently. Similarly, I'm, I'm enormously uh, privileged uh, to introduce Professor Vivekananda Jha, who is uh, uh, joining us from London now. Uh, he is the Executive Director at the George Institute of Global Health, India, Chair of Global Kidney Health, Faculty of Medicine, Imperial College of London, and President of International Society of Nephrology. Professor Zha has wide-ranging research interests, including understanding the health and societal impacts of kidney disease around the world, and developing affordable, scalable, and sustainable primary and secondary prevention tools. He has worked with many organizations, including WHO, to develop clinical practice guidelines and advocacy papers, has lectured extensively around the world, and is a prolific writer and editor. So without further ado, uh, I turn to Dr. Koirala to initiate the session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suman. Uh, good afternoon, namaste, Sabezanalai, and good morning for our panelists in London, and good evening for panelists in uh, Queensland. Uh, so without any further delay, uh, I'd like to welcome first uh, our panelists, my co-chair, uh, all the distinguished uh, guests, and all the delegates who are present here this afternoon. Uh, I would like to apologize again uh, on behalf of the organizers uh, for the delay, uh, and I hope our researchers at NSRC can do more research to fix this issue. So that's supposed to be a joke. Um, so without any further uh, delay, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Mohan Raj Sarma, Professor Dr. Mohan Raj Sarma, to deliberate his uh, uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Mohan Raj Sarma is professor and head of Department of Neurosurgery at TU uh, Teaching Hospital. Uh, he's also director of the research at Institute of Medicine at TU, and he's editor of Journal of Neuroscience in Rural Practice and Journal of Global Neurosurgery. Uh, he has uh, many other uh, information on his biodata. I'm not going to spend on those, but he has more than 95 publications, including a publication on principles of health science research, which everybody should uh, read uh, if you are doing research in Nepal. Uh, he has a lot of uh, information on that book, uh, good information. And uh, he has a special interest uh, in cerebrovascular and skull-based surgery. Uh, biostatistics in public health and neurosurgical education research and publication and global surgery. Dr. Mohan Rasarma. Thank you so much, Professor Koirala, for your kind introduction. It's been a great pleasure to be here. And I thank the organizing committee of the Nepal Health Research Council for giving me this opportunity to advocate research for the clinician. So the title of my presentation today is clinician as a researcher and what are the opportunities and challenges we have currently in the country. I think my presentation will, start, will, will work as a starting point for a discussion and asking questions to the panelists and moderator. Couple of my slides introductory. First of all, I bring one greeting, warm greetings to all of you from the Department of Neurosurgery at TUTS and the, from the Department of Research at the IOM. So this is my question to the audience. Does doing research make you rich and famous? This is my question to the audience. Anyone? No, it doesn't? Okay. Anybody thinks making, you know, doing research and doing publication? You know who this person is? Anybody? Please say, who? 
Okay, slide, slide, why not, eh? Slide, move, why not, say, now? You know who these people are? Michael Jackson and the girl below. Oh. Correct. I know who this gentleman is. <laughs> Slide Ram is on Mo Boy Raz in it, has Okay. Slide Mo Boy Raz in You know, you know who this gentleman is? I did not know either before, you know, only when I started making this presentation, I started, I knew it. So he is one of the very famous person, you know, in the, in the wave of science. The ranking wave of universe, this was published in January 2022. He is the one with the highest age index, you know, more than 350 age index, and he has so much of citation. But he is hardly known. Michael Jackson, Aishwarya Rai did not publish a single paper. They are very famous. So we don't make any money, and arguably, we don't become famous by doing research and doing publication. And that takes us to the question why should we do research then? Let's go to the next slide about the, you know, what happens when we all concentrate only on that performing surgeries and seeing patient in the clinic and not participating in research. I need your participation here again. What will happen to us? Okay, well, I mean, we will all, we will be better and better in what we will be doing. That's number one. And uh, patients and war staff will admire you for your great surgical skill. You will be loved by, by your peer. And you will make some money, not as much as, as money as Michael Jackson, but you did, do make some money. And your colleagues will envy you. Isn't this great? It is. But there are some options, but you know, we will be, be becoming more and more good craftsmen and rather than a scientist. We will be a technician, we will not be a scientist. That's number one. You say Songai Bako Sainatara, there is a problem, eh? Slide changing. You are using a sink bar, no? Oh, okay. You got that, you got that. Okay, that changed more, right? Okay. So, Next, my next point would be, I think, yeah. Slight change to your math, boy. Eh? There is a, we can do research on this also next time. <laughs> Why it's not working this way? Because it will, it will take away the charm of, you know, slowly disclosing the information. So how does it work? You know, maybe you change or the you change one more second. Yeah, but I, I change here, it should change automatically. Point about the porn, I don't want to say any more. Porn? Either porn or. I'll do from here, maybe you change there. Answer? You answer? Got this up? Okay. So, Okay, so this I took from the Professor Grotendius, he's a professor of neurosurgery from, from Netherlands. What, what he says is, what happens when we all concentrate only on performing surgery and seeing patient in the clinic but not participating? We'll become better and better in those surgeries we perform more often. We make more money and colleagues will envy you. It looks that it will be great, but we will be nothing more than good craftsmen rather than a scientist. And we will need other people with knowledge to tell us what we should be doing. You know, we will be going into the middle ages of barber surgeon, you know. Barber surgeon, arguably, the shortest time to perform amputation was nine seconds. So we'll just be a technician, we'll be a great craftsman, but we won't be a scientist. And we will be a knowledge consumer, not a knowledge 
producer, which is not nice. We should both be knowledge consumer as well as knowledge producer as a scientist. So these are the reasons why we should be continuing research being a clinician. What is the rationale for conducting clinical research? Apart from just a couple of things I said earlier, earlier, more holistic way, this is what the Global Forum for Health Research said that strengthening the research capacity in developing countries with different geography and culture is one of the most effective and sustainable ways of advancing health and development in these countries. So only way we can advance the health of our country is by doing research, apart from other things. So why should we do in Nepal? These are the reasons. We, so far, we largely depend on the results of the research in the high-income countries, which may not be fully generalizable in Nepal. We have seen that in many areas, you know. The research which is done in U.S. is not completely replicable here in Nepal, but unfortunately we are doing that. That needs to be broken. Next is scarce data on diseases prevalent in our country. Each country will do the research in the diseases which are prevalent to them, not to us. So we need to generate our own data on the diseases which are endemic to us. And you know, third thing and most important is clinicians should be in the forefront is they have the first hand access to the patient. You know, I have the access to all the neurosurgery patients are teaching us. And so I should be really in the forefront doing research on neurosurgery. Same thing applies for pediatrics, same applies for OBGYN. That's what I believe it to work. And, uh, you know, by this I have learned working as a neurosurgeon for 20 years. We will not be able to change the statistics of my country by only doing the clinical work. No matter how many operations I keep on doing 24 hours a day, unless I work on the prevention of the head injury by generating data and publishing, I will not be able to change the statistics of head injury in Nepal that I have learned. This is the reason we need to do research in Nepal. This I copied from my World Journal of Orthopedics uh, in a paper, Research in Spinal Surgery, Evaluation and Practice of Evidence-Based Medicine. What it says is, if spine surgeons do not want poor quality study to dictate and limit the clinical decisions, then responsibility rests with this group of practitioners to design high quality study to justify certain treatment modality. If I believe in certain modality, I should produce data and I should be practicing based on my that, that data. Let's briefly go back to now to, I think I made enough point regarding why we should be doing research. Now I'll take you briefly to the status of the health research in Nepal. Arguably first health research was done in nine, back in 1951, carried out with the help of United States Operation Mission. That time it was the USAID now. And it was done as a malaria survey in Kathmandu. So in, in terms of record, this is the first then we have multiple landmark studies done from 1965 down to 1990. Major landmark studies were done. Real paradigm shift in terms of clinical research was, uh, you know, made with the establishment of Nepal Health Research Council in 1991. And uh, this was the... And then how the growth of the clinical research uh, started in Nepal will be shown in the subsequent slide. I would like to show this picture, uh, this uh, uh, screenshot of the first, arguably the first paper published from Nepal by none other than Brigandra Raj Pandey, sir. On the my he has written one article, Myocardial Infarction in Nepal, published in 1970. So motive of publication was there also, though it was in a very small form. This was a paper published from uh, Dr. Pitambar Gautam in 2017. Though he has, in his title, he has said that the, all the bibliographic evidence from 2004, he has actually looked at the, all the publication from Nepal listed in the wave of science since 1966. So he has given a beautiful graph in this scenario, and he has divided the Nepalese research into three, three periods. One before 1989, another after, uh, 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 from 1990 to 2005, and then 2005 later. Before 1989, there was low volume, negligible growth of the research, and lack of distinct trend until 1989. You know, though there were major landmark studies, but there was no definite trend. 
uh, after that from 1990 to 2005 there was some acceleration of the growth but you know there was uh, we had a civil unrest maoist insurgency so that insurgency kind of affected the health research also so there was some growth but not that much but after 19 2005 there was rash, rapid acceleration And one good news is this, you know, the clinical medicine, they, they, they look at all the publication from Nepal, including agriculture, geoscience, and all these things, but clinical medicine was the number one. So 40% of the entire publication contribution from Nepal from 1996 to 2016 was by clinical medicine, which is a very good news for all of us. Another paper published by Dr. Singhara in the Asian Pacific Journal of Public Health, and he has looked at the only medical research and publication, only from the medical science. And uh, they gleaned from 1996 to 2007, altogether 631 publications were there from Nepal. And 11% of those were published in Nepalese Medical Journal, rest were published in International Journal. And, uh, you know, this is the trend which is very important. You know, more than two-thirds of the article had Nepalese author as at least one co-author, but 51% were the first Nepalese as the first author. That is very nice. And uh, one, another thing was 78% had a quantitative research, whereas 22% uh, only had qualitative. And these were the most common research topic done, you know, more emphasis in child health and nutrition, maternal women's health, and when the HIV and AIDS came into existence in 1980, then a lot of paper on reproductive health and HIV. These are the main contributors of uh, the publication. Another trigger point was the earthquake of April 15, 2015. You know, every, you know, every calamity comes with some blessing. And with this uh, earthquake, then it stimulated a lot of publication and research on different areas. And up to 2020, still the earthquake related papers are being researched, are being done and published. Altogether, 112 papers related to earthquake were there. This was, uh, you know, recent publication from November 2021. Another, you know, trigger point was the COVID-19 of, you know, this Wuhan uh, 2020. So they, Dr. Rupesh Rao, debuted a scientific contribution on Nepal on COVID-19. And there was altogether 72 publication from Nepal related to COVID-19 only. So this is a significant contribution to the world body of literature regarding the COVID-19 status. 77 publication were from Kathmandu. This is where we need to put emphasis on. We have to take research beyond Kathmandu also. And uh, another good news was 82% of the uh, research were published in international medical journals. So we have a wider audience. Good. 39% uh, were original articles. And uh, see, compared to the previous paper I just quoted, now Nepalese uh, researchers are working more as a principal author. The trend is there. So they are leading the, leading the research and obviously publishing as the first author, which is also a good news. And uh, this could be I taken either good or bad. Most of the papers they were generated from either TU Teaching Hospital or Patent Academy of Health Sciences. So other public, other institutes should also take the lead and start publishing the paper. So I just mentioned there were three important triggers for accelerated growth of research in Nepal. So 2005 was the beginning of the you know start of many private medical colleges in Nepal with a mandatory postgraduate program, MD, MS, DM, MCS, MPhil, PhD, with, they had the mandatory research work. So that kind of stimulated to do at least small scale research. That was one main reason. Another was earthquake and third was the COVID-19. So they are, they are considered as the major trigger point where the research was accelerated. So just looking at the clinical trial dot gov, I searched this just a couple of days ago. There are ongoing 208 
researchers who are listed in clinicaltrial.gov uh, from Nepal, which is also a good, uh, uh, good news for us. And uh, some studies were interventional in nature. For example, vaccine trial. Currently, two vaccine trials are almost in near completion in Nepal, which is also a good news. So this was a little old paper from 2013 about the status of the research in South and uh, in seer countries, including Nepal. And Nepal, to me also, it was, it was new that we have also been able to do phase one and phase two clinical trial even back in 2012 also. So, you know, some studies have been done. Nepal has been represented in the world map, but in a very small scale. For five minutes. Okay. So, clinical trials, uh, this is uh, the another paper, this is the same paper showing the top 10 leading countries in East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Unfortunately, Nepal is not there represented. Our hope is one day in the next uh, paper, we will also be represented there. So, what are the barriers and solutions? Insufficient research capacity is one of the most cited reasons why we, can, we cannot do high-end research, but this has been improving and the potential sol solution is there should be at least one research center or dedicated research department under all medical institution. You know, my personal combination with many medical institutes, there is no dedicated research department in the country. If they want to run the medical college, there should be a dedicated research department which will oversight. That we have been advocating, that should be, that will indirectly help increase the research capacity. Next is inadequate research enthusiasm. That is, uh, that is there. To increase that, you know, we can do many things. Like we can incorporate the research methodology courses in undergraduate and postgraduate program. Seniors should always encourage the junior to conduct uh, research, and there should be some incentive for the researcher. If I inc do research only for passion, it will not last long. There should be mot strong motivation for a researcher to conduct research. That, should, that will help a lot. Lack of expertise is also there, but it is also improving. Periodic training and multinational collaboration is the way to address this issue. Brain drain has always been an issue all over the world, you know, all over the, it happens, but you know, there are ways how you can uh, counter this. Developing adequate infrastructure at home is one way to go. And another is ensuring financial security to the researcher. If you ensure financial security, give them a great place to work, of course they will stay in their own country. So that should be to the policy maker. What are our strengths in terms of research in Nepal? We have enormous research potential. We are, we are sitting in the gold mine, but we have not been able to tap it as much as we'd, we'd like to. Uh, we have made quite significant advances during the last two decades, evidenced by the high citation of Nepalese uh, papers, but we should not stop there. And a third important strength, uh, our strength is research can be done in a very cost-effective way and it, can, it will be responsive to our local need. Our weakness is still suboptimal capacity for research is there. We will be improving this. Still a lack of interest and pessimism among the clinicians, especially in non-academic center. There is simply not drive. At least in academic center, you need to have at least three, four paper published before you can be promoted. But in non-academic, that also not there. So there should be, you know, we should develop our own interest sometime, you know. Not everything can be equal, equal to money also. You know, you should develop passion, develop our own data, that kind of thing has to be there. Another dangerous thing is mushrooming of many healthcare journals with suboptimal standard in Nepal. Anything you write can be published here, unfortunately, which is not right. There should be some, at least some minimum regulatory ability that will standardize the thing. Nebzol is there. Nebzol is doing a great work, but you know, you can, uh, you, your journal cannot, may not be listed in Nebzol and it still may be widely circulated. That should be, uh, uh, that should be addressed. And another is risk of falling prey to many predatory and close journal in Nepal. This is a billion project. You know? So many, you know, this uh, predatory journal around and the new researcher fall prey to it and that should also be cautioned. So to conclude my slide, this I took from Susutra's uh, Sloko Sanu Bandena Jivita. 
this is, you know, Sanskrit is a very telegraphic language and, and from this, you know, from the, you know, continuity, through continuity survives. We do a small research, our junior do big research, then, then, so it is the continuity of the research that should be, uh, that should be encouraged, you know. Through the continuity of inspiring and motivating young researcher, our clinical research will survive. This concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Mohan Raj Sarma, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, uh, yeah, the question we have kept for the last, so please, uh, well, please be seated. And just uh, uh, it re when he was presenting and asking, just it reminded me for my generation people that when he, Haribang Rai Bachchan was in Kathmandu, some of the media person asked him, Last year, your son visited Amitabh Bachchan. There is a big crowd, but when you visited, there are none. His answer was very touchy to the researcher. He said, see, go and see in the library how many are sitting. And look the cinema theater, how many are there. So you are from the entertainment industry, and you are in a uh, center for higher learning. It cannot be compared. The matter is that culture of research in Nepal was very poor. The one important thing is the linguistic barrier we have. Nepal never colonized, so English itself was a barrier, which gradually changes. I belong to the Health Sciences University, which is started its a pioneer work in research, BP Kerala Institute of Health Sciences, which was first to ask for promotion certain number of indexed scientific paper from one rank to another. And that was the culture we have started. And gradually throughout the country we adopted it. So naturally it will take time, but what we are doing is wonderful. Thank you very much. Now we'll move to the panelist, I suppose. And then uh, for the panel, my sincere request is please uh, stick with your time. It's a uh, 10 minutes. And uh, five minutes per person. So you were reduced half, sorry. <laughs> uh, now the uh, panelist we have national. Professor Dr. Saros Prasad Vajha, Dr. Professor Dr. Abhinav Baidya, Dr. Amit Joshi, and Prabhat Adhikari. And we have some international panelists as soon, Professor Dr. Jeremy Day, Professor Bala Binkates, Professor Bibek Anand Jha. And without delaying and taking much time, I request, uh, let us start with the Sarat Prasad Vajha, please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, uh, Mr. Chairperson and all the distinguished guests. I'm a clinician. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm practicing psychiatrist for the last 20 years. And I can see the audience here, the young people in front of me. Probably 20 years back, I was also the same kind of the young, energetic uh, medical doctor. So wh while I see my experience, as a clinicians, we know the facts. But do we know how these facts generated? This was the questions actually today's morning when the inauguration session was there. Our policy maker wanted from our young scientists, let us generate the facts in our context. For example, as a psychiatrist, for example, if somebody suffered from depressions, and if I go and see in a textbook, for example, Mirta Japan, the dose might be 45 milligrams, 30 milligrams. But in our context, when I use 7.5 milligrams of metajepam, that works in Nepalese people who are residing in Nepal, but who works in uh, Europe or Australia, probably they need more uh, doses. Why? So this is some example of the science. We need to generate the science. We need to generate the facts regarding our setting because depression in Nepal, treating depression in Nepal, and treating depression in other countries as an individual differs a lot, plenty. So to me, my 20 years experience, what I think that let us have the research practice. Let us have the research uh, qualities, develop the research quality practices because our setting is completely different than the other settings. That is the one reason. And the other reason is, uh, uh, you know, uh, this is, if I, my 20 years experience, if I 
generate the facts regarding treating depressions by medicine or counseling, it makes a sense. So to my young uh, uh, graduates, if we develop that skill during these period times, probably you will have more than 100 articles when you, you reach in my positions. My, in the first, my first decade of my experience as a clinician, I had rarely, rarely, you know, just publishing articles was my only uh, one of my, uh, you know, uh, duty. Just publishing articles and getting, you know, promotions. But coming to this years after being a professor, what I can say is, you know, research is the part of our life. And if we can generate, really generate, the, it's something like the raw materials. And that will definitely give us the benefit, the old people will be benefited. So my concern is actually the especially young scientists. So let us develop the practice, develop this research uh, skill, research knowledge. That will definitely, you will be a good clinician, but if you want to be a good researcher, you should have these qualities in your early stage of life. This is what is my experience. Thank you. So maybe the next, please, uh, uh, Abhinav, Dr. Uh, Abhinav. Uh, thank you, thank you, Parasar. Uh, thank you, Dr. Koryala. Uh, of course, the issue that uh, we are discussing is of utmost importance, uh, but are we having it in the right forum or not is, is one of the, I think, foremost questions that I have. Uh, we all in this room are, I think, already converted. We have done research and we love research. Uh, but I think this message should reach out to the people who are not in this room. And, and what would be the forum for that? I, th I think that is something probably at the national level and maybe later at the provincial level, NHRC should think about. Uh, we have, for example, as I see the abstract book, there are members in the uh, advisory committee from different um, societies, uh, clinical societies, can we have a meeting or workshop with those societies and start off something that they can actually you know, convey to their members, to their maybe fellow doctors and, and other health professionals? So I think, uh, so we are not, I think, speaking in the right forum is, is what I think is, is one of the problems that we have. Second is, is uh, we are compartmentalizing uh, research and clinical works uh, to a larger extent. Even in the ministry, we have NHRC separate. To what extent the work of the ministry itself is researched upon? Uh, maybe, you know, very rarely. Uh, do each of the divisions or the centers, they have their own research wing or something uh, that they, you know, they, they can learn from? Maybe, you know, not many of the centers and divisions have. So maybe we need to think about that as well. And the thought that is coming to my mind is, when we are teaching uh, research, uh, most of the time we are teaching about the field epidemiology, which is most of the time not very useful for the clinicians. To what extent are we having training packages that would speak to the clinician? You know, the, the different sampling methods, they are always about you know, some, some community. How would that be applied in the context of the patients that they see in the hospital? So we are not tailoring our, our uh, you know, research methodology to suit the clinicians. So these are a few things I think that come to my mind uh, to begin with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Abhinav Baidya. Now we'll take a break from uh, a live uh, presentation and go to uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Jeremy Day from London. Uh, if he's online, please. Uh, Give him the audio and maybe if you can project him. Are we ready for Dr. Day or to uh, Aunuva? Hello. It's okay. Please, Hello. Dr. Day, please go ahead. So, I am uh, talking. So what, what we are doing today is we are uh, discussing 
uh, how do we promote uh, clinical research in Nepal? So you probably heard some of the presentation. So uh, please go ahead and uh, you know give your deliberation. Thank you. Right. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, it's uh, fantastic to be involved in your meeting. Uh, I'm talking to you from Vietnam. Um, I think the the thing that's very clear for me as a clinician, and I think for all of you too, is that we are absolutely surrounded by research questions. Every time we see a patient on our ward round uh, and we're not quite sure what to do with them, uh, we are, um, th there's a research question there. And where we make decisions for our patients, where we don't have good evidence from randomized control trials about how to treat them, uh, we're potentially putting our patients at risk. And, and those decisions might be as simple as, do I treat this patient with a soft tissue infection of the, of the skin for seven days or, or 14 days? Uh, we don't have good answers for those very simple, very common uh, treatment decisions that we make. And I think there's a challenge for all of us interacting with, um, with uh, uh, patients and relatives and the public and our colleagues and our funding bodies and our regulatory bodies to help them understand that uh, that where we don't have evidence for patients we're putting them at risk and in uh, fact Dr. enrolling Day. patients into trials and randomized trials is a safe thing to do for our patients. And we really uh, need sorry Dr. Paradigm Professor shift. Day, uh, can you hear me? Uh, I can, yeah. Would you be able, sorry for interruption, uh, would you be able to turn on your video? If not, uh, that's yep, okay. I can try, yep. Uh, it says I cannot start the video because the host has stopped it. Um, I'm sorry, so I, I cannot turn the video on from this end. I think it has to be done. Okay, it, it should be, I think they turn end. it on, so. Okay, thank you, please go ahead. Okay, so I really, I think I'm saying, uh, so one of the major barriers to uh, getting clinical trials done is the time delays in terms of getting regulatory approval for what we do. And it's absolutely essential that we, that we are scrutinized and that we operate in a system that is safe for patients. But uh, I think what our regulators sometimes fail to see is that treating patients where there isn't good evidence is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, and it has uh, health costs for patients and it has financial costs for our health services and our health infrastructure. Uh, so um, I think, um, uh, I'm just getting asked to start my video. So um, I think uh, we need something of a paradigm shift. And I think uh, I've worked with many of you in Nepal on, on the recovery trial of treatment for or COVID, which has been a fantastic experience. Um, but really, uh, one of the great things about working with Nepal has been how efficient um, your ethical review boards have been in terms of reviewing the protocol as novel interventions are added and as decisions to stop uh, treatments are made. And so, and, and, and that's really, um, uh, illustrated by the fact that Nepal has led the way for international sites in the recovery trial in terms of recruitment of patients. So many thanks to all of you who've been involved in looking after COVID-19 patients and working with that trial because you have made a fantastic contribution to global knowledge about how best to treat hospitalized patients with, with COVID. So I think um, if I was uh, talking, if I was trying to encourage doctors to do research, I think the first things I would say are um, Involving your patients in well-designed clinical trials is a safe thing to do. And we worry that we're putting patients at risk, but it's not as much, we're not putting patients, we're putting patients at much more risk when we're giving them treatments that, we're, that we don't have good data for. And we're making those kinds of decisions every day as doctors. Secondly, don't worry, don't think I've never done research before. I don't know how to formulate a research question. Every time you see a patient and you're not sure what the exact right treatment for that patient is, that's a research question. Um, and we're surrounded by them. Uh, and finally, doing research is, is, uh, is great fun. Uh, it's very creative. So uh, it adds another facet to your job, uh, which uh, makes you happy. Uh, and finally, I think we have a job, all of us as doctors and, and researchers, to engage with the public, engage with the patients, their relatives, 
uh, and with our regulators to, uh, to um, explain the importance of generating good data for recruiting operations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Day. Thank you for your uh, kind words and also for um, including Nepal as part of the recovery trial, which has helped our researchers to learn research methods, uh, the international research methods. So thank you for taking your time and being here this afternoon. Uh, so we'll proceed with our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Amrit Joshi. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, you see, um, in my opinion, uh, we have talked a lot about theory of research. So how to do theory, why it is important to do research. You know, being part of uh, uh, Nepalese Association of Medical Editors, we have conducted about 300 such, you know, workshops. But of late, what we have to understand is practical things. So doing research requires a lot of time lot of commitment. Clinicians doing research is absolutely different thing. A non-clinician doing research and a clinician doing research are two different things. So same theory cannot be applied to the both the groups. Now you see, if you do a clinical research, you need samples. So samples come from patients. If you are a busy clinician, you don't have time because you have to see those patients. If you are not very busy clinician, again you don't have time because you have to run from one hospital to another hospital so that you, make, you can make money for your bread and butter. So this is the basic thing why research is not propagating so nicely amongst the clinicians. So uh, uh, through Nepal Orthopedic Association, uh, uh, we, have conduct, we have conducted about seven workshops for busy clinicians. So how to do research for the busy clinicians? Either they are senior or they are junior. Either they are busy by too many patients or they are busy by running one hospital to another hospital. So we have been conducting this for last three, four years and then results have started coming out and our Nepal Orthopedic Association journal started getting regular you know, papers. So the most important thing for clinician, I just would like to say that do not separate your research from a clinical work. So your clinical work should be the research and you research on your clinical work. So all of a sudden you wake up in the morning and you want to do a research on something extra that you don't, do not do or you are not tuned to, it's not going to happen. So do research of those things that you meet day and night every day. So I remember one very interesting research which has been done when I was doing, uh, when I was in army hospital. So why even army doctors come late to the hospital? So we saw the data and they say that uh, the data of the, um, you know, Hazir Garni data and they say that it's many 70% people, they come late. So what is the reason? We found out that because, uh, they, because of the traffic, because of the so many things. Then we again further continued this research and we found out that who are the people through which route they come and they are delayed. And we were very sure that this route was, you know, traffic filled. So you change this route. So this is such a simple study which is done by our student. And then we found that implemented that and we found that this research was done by medical student, by the way. And then it changed the whole, you know, thing. So we have to identify a good topic, good subject, which is suited to that particular clinician rather than which is in the trend. So if we learn retrospectively, see ourselves what I'm doing, and if you convert what you are doing into research, probably this amalgamates with your work. It doesn't consume your extra time and you can do a research. So that is the only thing I can add. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Uh, next speaker is Dr. Uh, Prabhat Adhikari. I'll just give a little background and ask question to you. Dr. Prabhat Adhikari is double uh, board certified uh, physician from the United States. He is board certified in internal, I'm sorry, infectious disease and uh, critical care medicine, also internal medicine, so triple board certified. Uh, so uh, he is, unlike the rest of us, he's in private sector trying to create research uh, organizations in private sector. So. Please share your experience and also the challenge you have faced and if you have any suggestions. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much.
Um, so um, I've made some points, so I'll uh, speak in Nepali and English to elaborate on the points. And I've been given five minutes, so I'll try to finish in five minutes. So first of all, research culture, we should make a habit of don't be scared to ask questions. The moment you are scared to ask any stupid question, then you are not into research. You come out of school, unza bani chay. brought up ne jiste unza. Just like with respect to our uh, seniors, amro guru oru ayi unza ina. Amro guru oru chay malai the dum ramal sanga pran vo. Amle questions are been sodiya taro. Kal kal le medical school mein isto pran unde ki kuni question sodi bani. Is it a stupid question? Or kal kal chay tu sodi bidya thila ina teacher le chay isto question bani sodi yo. Isn't that stupid? Bani ra tein sodi unza. The moment you say that, tu student ko research jun jun soul unza. You're killing that. I know. Just one important question. I think you're saying, "I'm brought up. I'm a society part of Surunza. I'm a schooling part of Surunza." Then what? I'm letters now. There's some. I'm a research culture. Say, just so that our government is there. Our government is supposed to be like that. Example. Our second question is just so that Besar, Besar of I'm a Poyla Group Prime Minister. Say, Besar is eating. Besar is drinking. Say, Corona is like that. Say, Bani is like that. So, the media is like that. There is a lot of fun. तर इसलिए मैं एक्जापल को रूप में क्या लिराशु बेसार के एंटीमाइक्रोब काम कर आयुर्वेदिक मेडिशन बड़ हमें सुनी रहेक हो हम हजर बुआ भनी रहेक हो तर कसरी काम कर रिसेंट लिटरेचर में के भैर बेसार भि कुर्कुमिन भाई तत्व हो सब्सटेन्स बेसार भिता अरुण तत्व हो कुर्कुमिन भाई एट सब्सटेन्स हो दुटा प्रपर्टी होता एंटी कैंसर अर्क एंटी फाइब्रोटिक इट्स अलरेडी प्रूवन र अलग से यूनाइटेड स्टेट्स लगाए डेवलप्ड कंट्रीज में से इंडिया चाइना बाढ़ से बेसार को टैबलेट्स बिक्री होने जा कि नॉन एटी बेसार से आवश्यक रूप में यूज़ हो रहा है तो हम रूम में से बेसार ले आवश्यक रूप में काम घर से ही करते हैं ना कसरी घर से केपन था से ना इसमें से प्रॉब्लम किया त्यो डीज और को लिस्ट करें पची फाइटोकेमिस्ट सांब बसने पड़े हो फाइटोकेमिस्ट फाइटोकेमिस्ट सांब बसे रहते हैं क्या क्या केमिकल्स आ रहे हैं उनसे कुन कुन केमिकल्स आ रहे हैं हमें एक्सट्रैक्ट डालने सकते हैं और त्यौहार में देखो तो इसको फिर बेंच वर्क होला बनो को अर्थात तुम्हारे बायरस लैब में चाहिए टिश्यू कल्चर में चेक करने चाहिए अथवा एनिमल मॉडल में चेक करने चाहिए मतलब यू माइट नीड अब टिश्यू कल्चर स्पेशलिस्ट अथवा एनिमल मॉडल में चेक करने यू माइट नीड अ वेटनरी डॉक्टर आई ना अब जिस वजह एनिमल मॉडल में तो मतलब चेक करते हैं इसी फेज वन फेज टू फेज थ्री ट्रायल म हम लोग मचे रिसर्च करते हैं तो साइलोज़ में काम करेंगे जैसे कि मेडिकल रिसर्च बने पची या पब्लिक हेल्थ एक तरह अन्य मेडिकल डॉक्टर एक तरह बेडने डॉक्टर एक तरह अन्य कोलैबोरेशन सही ना एग्जांपल नेपाल में एंटीमाइक्रोबियल रेजिस्टेंस को थोड़ा प्रॉब्लम सा और था कि समय एंटीमाइक्रोबियल रेजिस्� अच्छा ये एग्रीकल्चर को एक्सपोर्ट बन चाहिए पेस्टिसाइड तो केमिकल स्पेशलिस्ट होगा चाहिए तो मैं को अब पेट्स और मात्र तो मैं को कैटल्स में एंटीमाइक्रोब रेजिस्टेंस समझते हो ह्यूमन में ट्रांसफर होने से बन सी वन हेल्थ पॉलिसी में जान पड़े बेटने डॉक्टर चाहिए और ह्यूमन डॉक्टर तो हमरो इंटर डिपार्टमेंट अथवा गवर्नमेंट को विभिन्न एजेंसी और बिचों को कोलैबोरेशन त्यों ही सब कुछ सही रिसर्च करनी बनी प्लेटफॉर्म सही कॉमन प्लेटफॉर्म सही ना बनी से मेरे बुझाई हो आई कुड बी रॉंग आई ना और इसमें मिले आर को टाइम सी दिन लाया ला आर को मिले गवर्नमेंट खोजी कुछ सही जस्ट की हमले अब मोबाइल सब बंदा करता है ऐसा ही नेपाल में क्लिनिकल ट्रायल करना सकें इनसे बन्नी कुराने यो इंटरटेन करिए ना बन्नु करता त्यो सोचिए को थिए ना टीम बिल्डअप करने प्रॉब्लम थियो और सेकंड कुरा जैसे हमरो जस्ट की तम्बाल कुने एवढा मॉलिक्यूल आई ना मॉलिक्यूल लिया र जानन सब ने मॉलिक्यूल मंजी एनएचआरसी बाटो फुल अप्रूवल ना पाया समा डीडीए बाटो अप्रूवल पाया ना डीडीए बाटो फुल अप्रूवल ना पाया समा एनएचआरसी में अप्रूवल पाया ना और तेरी ड्यूटी में घुमना घुमना में टाइम जान्स मंजी हमरो गाइडलाइन पॉलिसी में क्यों उन्हें पढ़े ना स्टेप वन तो मैं डीडीए जानूँ डीडीए बाटो यो यो क्लीयरेंस ले रहा हूँ 
Step two, the NSRC is ERB clearance lines, and trial insurance layer on us, and the site service is not work for the person. So it's post a theater. Raru Kura say, I'm a Nepal Massey, clinical trial to my God, even a trial insurance science. I'm a insurance board, ma, insurance board, ma, oil sum of clinical trial insurance, Unuporsa Bunny, invision Bunny Gorigo China. Invision Gorigo China. Only I'm late to trial Kula insurance in the Harry, Nepal insurance company early, trial insurance issue gone on no soccer. I'm a team manager time lose what this was the international insurance companies on Nepal insurance tie up got on Bola insurance leader socky and Bola trial or get body when see I'm a insurance company or much a resource of the insurance collection trial care insurance in parts of any bears the sign or I'll go for as a coordination the career got the head in Nepal not just to be inter department coordination for the bunny but see I'm a Nepal ma I'm a advocate got Rocky or just to get Nepal my order FDA sign just to get for example curcumin one of the best I don't know बेसार को रिसर्च करने चाहें तो बने तो पाएं बनों स्थली बनस्पति विभाग अथवा फॉरेस्ट्री विभाग में जानू पड़ता है अन्य आयुर्वेदिक विभाग बड़ा अप्रूवल पाउंड पड़ता है कुरकुमीन में केमिकल में तो पाएं चाहे क्लिनिकल ट्रायल करने चाहें फिर एनएचआर से डीडी बड़ा अप्रूवल इन पड़ता है और तो � अन्य फेरी एंड डीडी आओ नहीं एनएचआर से जाने तो इंटीग्रेटेड बाय ना तेज़ मासी फेरी तमाही बेसार कुछ सही एनिमल माती स्टडी करने सब नहीं फेरी बेडनरी में जाने पड़ला आई ना मासी तो ये वोटे प्लेटफॉर्म आया रहा हम लोग रिसर्च कर सही करने सही ना तो इस पोस्ट गाइडलाइन से एमिशन अच्छा ही ना तो इतिहो डेटा से नेपाल भित्र वोस्ट भाई को छाई न बने से तो डेटा सिक्योर होता है ना जिसमें जो हमारे स्पोर्ट्स गाइडलाइन उन्नत बरस और आपको कुछ ऐसे डेटा सेंट्रलाइज़ेशन उन्नत बरस बनु को अर्थात नेपाल को गवर्नमेंट में विभिन्न एजेंसी और बट डेटा होंगे एग्जांपल कोविड को मात्रा कुरा दें तो कोविड रो मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ हेल्थ विद्रोह के इ फिर आर को एचयूसी अन्य और को डिपार्मेंट्स उन्हें अर्बाड़े फिर आपने डेटा होना चाहिए और फिर कोविड के लाइजेंस सीसीएमसी को फिर आपने डेटा होना चाहिए मतलब योटे अस्पताल तीन तरह डेटा फाल्स है तर डेटा सेंट्रलाइज्ड है ना अन्य रिसर्च गवर्न इस मज़े हमले वड़ा गाइडलाइन के रूप में से इंटर एजेंसी से वड़ा गाइडलाइन के रूप में वन डोर पॉलिसी वड़ा गवर्नमेंट सॉक्ट पर्स द सर्विलेंस को डेटा वर्सेस रिसर्च को लाइज़ करने पाउंड पर्स ये बहन से आई थिंक देरी करा वर्सेस रिपीटेशन होता है ना रकाम गवर्नमेंट सॉक्ट इंच और अंतिम बंदा बंद हमले काम करता है जैसे फंडिंग को प्रॉब्लम सा है ना तो र रिसर्च में सब एक बार जैसे हाई फंडिंग को नॉन ओपन सकता है एग्जांपल से हमले ये वाला गवर्नमेंट हो जाएगा जैसे टेली आईसीयू बन करता है जैसे रिसर्च बनी को तो मैं को मॉलिक्यूल्स और से दिख मात्र टेस्टिंग है ना तो मैं को प्रोटोकॉल पर ट अतः योगा योगा थेरेपी दिन बो वंश यो तो लो लो बजट को प्रोग्राम्स हो रहे हैं इस तो कुछ हम अपने आमले क्लिनिकल ट्रायल और गणना साइंस तो रिसर्च बनी बिती के मॉलिक्यूल मात्रा है ना और देरी करा और गणना साइंस बनी करा चाहिए तो आमले बुझने पड़ा आई थिंक दैट्स प्रीडी मच थैंक यू this is what the plenary discussion has raised very pretended so so before i go to the uh, audience to ask some questions i'll just conclude the basic uh, presentation which they say is the cultural issues financial issues and legal issues culture we may be able to improve by being mentored or giving training and appreciating research starting from school evidence problem-based learning and research reasoning improving mathematics in education that could be a possibility but uh, whereas financial is concerned, I, I appreciate what Dr. Amit has said, that uh, moonlighting and research will, will go together or not. This will be a big question because we have experiences at BP Kerala Institute of Health Sciences. I did my post-graduation from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, which has no culture of moonlighting. That is a private practice. So if you do private practice, it is very difficult and hard to say that you can spend time for research. So when we talk about clinical research, there should be one institutions where answer should be. Not all the institutions, but one institution in the country where there should be no moonlighting to, to be the landmark of the research and reference center for the research, if that we can think ahead. And third is a legal, which very nicely the last presenter has raised. 
who should address these legal issues and uh, there are many especially when you want to do from the private sector i think it is a uh, uh, stretching the elephant by different reasons so with this uh, i just want to open the forum for the audiences please raise your hand and speak one at a time thank you very much Uh, simply trying to be an uh, icebreaker. Sometimes it happens, and I always try to do that. Myself, Subodh Sarma. Uh, I'm from natural science background. If I'm odd man out here, please do excuse me. I was invited at the inaugural, but I ended up attending the ceremony here. If you look at institution in this country, many institutions have grown to a larger extent: banking, hospital, health, this and that. And then if you look at research institution that has not grown to our expectation, we end up saying all the time that research should be initiated from universities. And what has happened to all of our surprise is that there is one institution that has grown to a, such an extreme extent that that has collapsed every other institution, and that is the political institution. You all agree with that. So I would like to hear from the panelists today, where should research be initiated? And how, how and when are we going to make our politics to such an extent that we encourage our faculties to do politics, be involved in politics, but not to allow the politics in academic institution? Your opinion, please. Thank you. Yeah, someone has to take the please. Who is comfortable with this? And has some experience of undergoing that. Some traumatic experiences, maybe. To answer the question. We are doing a lot of politics for universities. I'm not, I'm being honest. Please, so, uh, you all being panelists, it was a wonderful feeling today okay. that I happened to listen to such a such a great experience that you have expressed very honestly, being a clinical from medical background, what is the reason for which you have not been able to be involved in research. If research is not there in medical science, we end up with what that also we have come to know. You all agree that research should be done in, at the university level. Absolutely. And Absolutely. why that is not happening based oh. on your experience. Oh, okay, okay. okay, I got, uh, I'll try my best to answer from my perspective. I represent Tribune University Institute of Medicine. Compared to what we've been doing in 2009, compared to what we've been doing in 2022, we have done a lot. We have done a lot, but it's not enough. I don't say it is not enough, but compared to what we were, we have generated many baseline data. Now, we don't have to say that the incidence of head injury is this much in the United States. No, we do have few data. So we do not have whole country data. We have done what we have not been able to do is large scale trials. Sir. Many retrospective studies, case control cohort, retrospective case series have been there. The large study intervention study are yet to be done. Currently at the Institute of Medicine, four randomized control trials are underway, which is great. One va COVID vaccine trial undergoing, another polio vaccine trial, SALT versus Savin trial, ESCO trial, other intervention studies are undergoing. I think same happens in BPKIHS Dharan also. And KU is also becoming very aggressive in terms of um, pouring out research. So RISA is still here. So there, and another is the research culture, sir. I think research culture is coming from within young researchers like Prabhat Adhikari. And all these who have been trained in a very uh, in areas where the culture of research is there, and they will bring the new, new thinking, new passion, and that will also improve. From 1922 now, uh, 2022, if we'll be alive and discussing the same thing in 19, uh, 2032, things will again be different. Right? And another thing is the University Grand Commission is also, the fund is there. I, somebody said that fund is not there. That is not true. There are at least 10 organizations who pump out fund for research. It may not be very big. 
only you know last month driven university research unit gave uh, 100 small scale research grant 40000 rupees as an mbbs student used to be a lot for me and you can do really good and same thing with the university grant commission nast also gives nepal health research council gives and there are many international organizations where we can apply and get the research so you have to have a passion to move it forward this is all just one minute, sir. First of all, thank you very much. Uh, I am as a teacher from Institute of Medicines. The most important, I can see our graduate here. If there is no examinations, nobody is going to read and, you know, put the efforts. That is one of our culture. So our curriculums, when we design our curriculums, uh, where uh, Professor Janak also graduated from the same institutes, uh, we need to review, we are reviewing our curriculums. And my, my, to my understanding, if we develop the capacity of research knowledge during their student periods, study training periods, and if we really do the examinations, probably that will be answered, I think, sort of question. That is my response to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we are, we are, yeah. I'm so there will be one more questions. Someone, please, if there is only last questions, if there is, so... We'll conclude the session after that. Hello, hello. Actually, your clinical theory discussion was my first attempt here. Actually, I don't belong from clinical background. Tara, I'm Dr. Prabhat Le. Agi, zone yota collaborative research ko gura gorn vayo. Tesh ma chay, I belong from plant biotechnology stream. Aba oily samma chay, I guess the yota onsa ni. Uh, root level but a plant but a extract nikalera ultimately clinical trial some of Pugego Kunepani research Nepal but a source to Malalag then I guess of a two I think two initiation would a big initiation one it you of especially phytochemistry go parts I do it just use your side could be girl a girl while I initiation this degree of a clinical side but as a you a strong collaborative work cosseri initiate girl so I can say I want to hear from I'm uh, a clinical doctor but thank you that is my question uh, thank you. Uh, more is my key one. Uh, limitations understand Nagari Kona research plan Goryo one is that research is not going to be fruitful and it's not going to be completed. So probably August or Liba Nubagusto Tapile one as a phase one my yogurney, Tugurney, Esogurney, but this Kolagi probably you need a certain institution which is dedicated to that. You need a government involving into that so that government finds out funds and then finds out the appropriate people to do that. This one's a clinicians are like two level co research, God Allah, it's quite difficult until only until unless you reach to third phase when real clinical practice comes. Uh if you force your student to do research, touch all of our heart that most of the research done by our student, are they ethically and morally conducted well? You say only so to parne bichar sa. This is the syllabus ma research garnei parne bandra rakhe ra. Are we going to produce more falsified data? You see, zaro ali ramre research to parne unsa. This is the mala chay sor ko kure ekdam ramre lathe. Probably we should start from schools. School bada suru garo, research garo sikhao, award dim tini or so that after 20 years, the new generation who comes, they know that research is a culture, it is not a compulsion. As a date ma medical colleges or ma subbala compulsion bada garae ku jun research or ucha, this ko data ko validity here neobani. I am sure that we have a lot of space to talk about the barima. Either it is coming from a apex institute of this country or it is coming from any apex institute of neighboring country. So probably rather than enforcing into a syllabus, probably if we think about enforcing into the culture, that is going to give us a good result. Thank you. At the end of the session, one, one take home this is uh, uh, it's uh, better to have no research than bad research. And uh, of course, the research costs money. The quality research is important. Uh, with this, I give my co-chair to continue and conclude the session. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this was a very a nice discussion. Thank you, panelists and all the uh, participants. And I know that uh, everybody here is interested in research, motivated to do research. That's why, you know, we are all here. 
uh, that shows that you know how much interest is there. Even in this room, we have a big number of uh, young uh, uh, future researchers or current researchers. So that's good to know. I just wanted to share a little bit of my experience. I know that we are we have gone over time, but I think it's important uh, from a. Uh, uh, experience in overseas in a country which is ahead of rest of the world in terms of research. Uh, I've seen that how they generate researchers and personally I've been involved in that. So it's not a magic thing like we discussed we have to develop a culture but how to develop that culture. So uh, first of all one thing I have seen the difference between here and over there the medical institutions here or the academic institutions here and over there is that the institutional research, what we call as a committee or institutional research board, is only for regulatory purpose. And its purpose is to teach ethics in research, not to, uh, you know, police the research. I mean, not, the, not to train the research and other things. So other aspect has to be done by a separate group of people who are actually expert researchers. So ethics is different from methods in research. So that has to be different. So there has to be a research committee or a, you know, research department that is there to train the researchers, educate the research, uh, give a course of research. Maybe there is a separate course of research for those who are interested rather than imposing everybody to do the research. So that's important. Then they, you will separate out the people who are actually interested in research, who are motivated to research, number one. Number two, so there are three points, so two more points. Number two, uh, it's important to uh, have a separate path. Either you can call it fellowship or PhD, whatever you can do it. So you can be MD, PhD, or maybe you can do some kind of other health course and become a fellow or PhD uh, as a researcher. So that's how you learn, because you're spending many years, four years to seven years, depending on where you are doing PhD and you are actually focusing on one thing and become expert in that area. That's how you become a researcher because you're expert in that field. You cannot just do you know, research here and there and uh, tits and bits and become a researcher. You have to spend time in particular organisms. For example, you can spend time in HIV-1. That's all you do for the rest of your life or something like that. So that's number two. Uh, so you have to do training and that's the committee's work is training, providing them assistance, maybe statistical assistance, grants, and things like that. So that's number two. Uh, and then number three, you have to create a position where actually the faculty is a career researcher. So you actually not only, you, you cannot be a clinician, educator, a researcher, private practitioner, everything, because you have only so much time in your hands. So that's why I think you have to have career researcher who will still see patients and educate, but rest of the time when they are not uh, teaching and not seeing patients, there will be a preserved time where you can go and you know, spend your time in lab or maybe in the clinical research or community research. So I think that's very important to create a culture of research and those people, those experts will guide and train the future research. That's all I wanted to say. So again, thank you all for being here for a great discussion, uh, including our international speakers. Thank you. So we'll uh, proceed with the vote of thanks to our uh, panelists, and then we'll proceed with uh, six presentations from our researchers. I, I think you can still wait here and we'll do the word of thanks at the end. That's the, you took on of last from Garner. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
So the next six presentations will be timed presentation. So uh, and the time will be 10 minutes for each presentation. Uh, and we'll give a warning bell at two minutes. And then uh, you have to wrap it up uh, two, mi uh, two minutes after that. So we'll start with uh, first presenter, uh, uh, Dr. or Apexia Nirola. Apexia Nirola, uh, laboratory errors in clinical biochemistry, the quality of laboratory uh, testing in BP Quiral Institute of Health Sciences, Nepal. Apexia, please come to the podium. Hello. A very warm good afternoon to everyone, respected dignitaries and my dear audience present here. I'm Dr. Apeksha Nirola. I'm going to present my research entitled Laboratory Errors in Clinical Biochemistry Lab, a Laboratory Testing at BP Kurala Institute of Health Sciences. So these are the uh, investigators and the co-investigators of this research. Uh, a brief background of why the errors are so important to be focused on. To err is human, as per the IOM report from United States in 1999, who gave the key message of three important strategies by which we could prevent the medical errors to some extent, and the most important being the prevention of the error so that uh, the recognition <coughs> and implementing those action uh, for the good uh, patient practice. So uh, these are the headliners I hope that everyone is well acquainted of, uh, still prevalent till today. Meanwhile in Nepal, they have been uh, 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 delineated by uh, the, uh, the health laboratory that laboratory errors are very prevalent and most of the reports have fallacies, but that not be true for most of the labs in uh, across the country. So this is an ideal healthcare system which we, already have, we always have dreamt of, patient-centeredness, safety, efficacy, and equitability. And this could be only achievable if the errors could be made less to, uh, less they, uh, to a very lesser extent. So I am being a laboratory personnel, I am uh, focusing to my uh, own goal, that is 
our laboratory cycle starts from the physician's brain till it reaches to the laboratory personnel and back to the physician's desk. So there could be error at any point of time and we can, uh, uh, we have to recognize it and then ultimately prevent it to a lesser extent. So we, al we always talk about the quality laboratory report where 100% is never achievable. So achieving a 99% level of quality means 1% failure rate, but what is there, uh, it might vary according to country, like in Nepal that might be more. In France it uh, reports 1% error rate means 50,000 parcels lost by postal services or 22 newborns falling by the hands of the nurses. So is it like we could uh, afford this 1% error rate as well? So that's why uh, my uh, research is mainly focused on the laboratory cycle which comprises of the three phases, the pre-analytic, analytic and the post-analytic. Though many of the strategies has been implemented to the analytical phase, I have been uh, looking for what are the errors that could occur in the pre-analytical phase and the reason being the maximum error occurring in that phase that is around 68.2% of the whole lab errors occurs in this phase. So that's why the evidence is uh, showing that the maximum errors occurring in this phase and uh, no studies could be like uh, we could uh, report from our setup. So uh, that made to do this research to identify and delineate what type of the pre-analytical errors could occur in the routine biochemistry lab and develop an instrument for the same. So it was done in BP Kurala Institute of Health Sciences for a period of one year. We screened 34,540 samples for a period of one year and um, in the routine biochemistry lab. And these were the variables, the inappropriate requisition form, the inappropriate sample, inappropriate transport, and inappropriate centrifugation. Uh, the outcome variables were the types and the frequencies of the error, and the statistical analysis was done according to the uh, need, and the results showed that among the 34,540 samples, 1,015 samples were subjected for rejection, which accounted for 2.93% of the total error. And the comparison of rejected samples showed that when we compare the inpatient and the outpatient services, surprisingly, the ICUs had maximum amount of the rejection compared to the ward and the outpatient services. So the frequencies of error showed that the hemolyzed sample were the maximum amount uh, uh, subjecting to the rejection. So, uh, and uh, the last one, that is the faulty transport uh, was uh, associated along with the date and time not mentioned in the requisition form. So uh, to conclude my presentation, I would like to say that laboratory cannot work in isolation. So there must be a collaborated interrelationship between the clinical clinicians and the laboratory personnel to prevent the laboratory errors to very uh, much extent. And uh, the probable reason of our study having more error from the ICUs and the critical care unit might be because of the workload and the pressurized environment in which the doctors and the nurses has to work. Uh, a last one that is the striking feature was centralized system uh, could be a reason where OPD services were also been shown to have 25% uh, of the error. So a practice of keeping record of each error every day for a month and looking back where we have gone wrong would be one of the possibility to prevent such error. So these were some pictures which I took during my study. You can see the inappropriate form, inappropriate uh, 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 sample. So quality is a journey and not a destination and we are updating ourselves each passing days to prevent this error to give a good quality service. Thank you. Thank you, Apiksha, for that short and sweet presentation. You still have time, so you can uh, take some questions. I don't see any hands raised, so uh, thank you again. So n next, uh, we have, uh, please, thank you, uh, Riju Manandar. Rizu Manandar, please come forward. Uh, the presentation is on evaluation of basic cardiovascular profile and prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors among the national level Sorry, athletes of Nepal. Point to me. Yeah. Yeah, really 
Good afternoon, respected panel of judges and the audience. Uh, I'm Dr. Rizu Mananda. I'm a cardiologist at Said Gangala National Heart Center. My topic of presentation is evaluation of basic cardiovascular profile and prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors among the national level athletes of Nepal. So first, a quick background. We all live in an era where we all have a pretty sedentary lifestyle. There is increasing trends towards the very sedentary lifestyles and there is a prevalence of obesity and with it, there comes the risk of cardiovascular disease and associated cardiovascular deaths. So in our day-to-day -day clinical practice, especially we physicians and cardiologists, what we do is we promote physical activities, regular exercise for more crucial than ever in our clinical practice. And it is at the forefront of the priorities of all scientific cardiovascular societies. So how do we define an athlete? An athlete is anyone. It can be you, it can be me, it can be anyone. Either it can be a professional athlete or an amateur athlete. Athlete is an individual of young or adult age, either amateur or professional, who is engaged in regular physical exercise training and it participates in official sporting events. On competitive athletes, as I said, is also known as a professional athlete who individualize, involved in regular, usually intense exercise trained and with an organized individual or team sports. Whereas uh, amateur athletes usually um, have uh, regular exercise and usually play for their own pleasure. So uh, when we talk about cardiovascular system and cardiovascular examination, the main thing which comes to our mind, basic investigation is ECG and then followed by echocardiography. So ECG and echocardiography are the most reliable and inexpensive ways to detect the adaptive changes of athlete's heart to intense exercise, which if used along with clinical examination and proper history taking, then it can have great effectiveness in detecting underlying heart disease that may imply a risk for people participating in sports. So when we talk about risk, the most important and the most life-threatening cause of death is sudden cardiac death which is the leading cause of uh, sports and exercise-related mortality in athletes. We, uh, the cardiovascular safety during exercise and sports participation for individuals at all levels and ages is imperative to avoid catastrophic and often preventable sudden cardiac death and has become a common goal among the sporting and uh, medical governing organizations worldwide. We, when we talk about athletes and sports person, we, we usually feel they are the most healthy, healthiest person in the world because they do their exercise regularly, even intense exercise. But according to worldwide data, the athletes are more prone to sudden cardiac death as compared to the normal healthy people of their age. So the main objective of my study is uh, it's to evaluate the baseline cardiovascular status and prevalence of cardiovascular risk factors among the national level athletes of Nepal, which I say till today haven't been done in Nepal. There is no single study in Nepal regarding sports cardiology and uh, the national level players, the cardiovascular status of national level players is still unknown. So when you go to the method, it's an uh, observational cross-sectional study where all national level football players who attended our center, that's Soit Gangalan National Heart Center, were included in the study. And uh, it's, it was done from April 2021 to September 2021. Uh, All the participants underwent physical examination, ECG, echocardiography, blood routine examination, and family as well as personal history were taken and recorded. So when we go to the results, uh, there were total 102 participants, all were national uh, football team players, including both male and female. Uh, when we look at the mean age, the mean age was 23.8, with a mean heart rate was 56.8 beats per minute, and most of them were uh, male participants, 77.5% of male and 22.5% were female. 
And so when we compare the baseline characteristics between the male as well as female players, uh, see most of them were equally distributed, such as age, historic blood pressure, heart rate were similar, but height, weight, and as well as body surface area, as we know, uh, were uh, really more uh, as compared in female participants as compared to female. Mm. When we look at the blood parameters, again, here we see uh, most of the blood parameters were uh, equally distributed, all the blood parameters were equally distributed between male and female uh, players. Uh, so when we talk about the cardiovascular risk factors among the national football players of Nepal, uh, there was no any prevalence of modifiable cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, tobacco consumption, or obesity seen in our players. However, there was 4.9 percent of the players had uh, overweight, that's their BMI was more than 25. So when we analyze the ECC of our players, uh, as I said, there was no significant difference in uh, heart rate of the um, uh, players in both uh, male as well as female pairs. The heart rate was in overall was 56.8, in male there was 58.14, and female is 54.22. Similarly, PR interval, QRS complex, as well as QT interval was also in similar range as compared to both the gender group. And ECG findings, uh, the most common ECG findings seen in our athletes, in our football players, were sinus bradycardia. It was seen in 63.7% of total players, and it, it was uh, more or less similarly distributed among male as well as female players. Uh, early repolarization was seen in 40.2% of the players. T-wave inversion was more common in uh, male players. Arterial ectopics were more common in female players. Ventricular ectopics were seen only in uh, uh, male players. Sinus arrhythmia, again, was more common in female players. First degree AB block was more common in uh, male players, was seen in 8.8% of the uh, players. And LVS pattern was only seen in uh, the male players. When we look at the echocardiography, I won't go into detail of the measurements. Uh, it, the measurements of the ventricular wall, its thickness is more or less, uh, there is no significant difference between uh, male players as compared to female, and it was uh, usually within the range. Mm. When we uh, look at the mitral inflow, as we say in echocardiography, also it was, uh, there is no significant difference between male as well as female participants. Mm. And again, when uh, we look at the right side of the heart, we say right side, it's right ventricular and right atrium study of the heart. Again, we say here, male and female participants showed a similar kind of findings. There was no significant difference. And when we summarize the eco findings, one patient, or what should I say, one player had atrial septal defect, which is a congenital heart disease. Uh, one player had rheumatic heart disease. Trivial MR was seen in 13.7% of the players, and trivial AR was seen as 1.9% of the players. Mild TRR was present in 15.6% of the player, and concentric remodeling of the left ventricle that are commonly seen in athlete hearts was seen in only 2.9% of our players. So, a structural and functional adaptive changes that the heart develops in response to exercise is classically known as athlete's heart. Exercise training may cause physiological and morphological cardiac adaptation, including sinus bradycardia, increase in LV internal diameter, and increase in LV mass, as we've seen, also known as LV remodeling. However, uh, as we did our study here in Nepal, there were some studies done worldwide, which we compared with our study. As we say here, the most of the findings uh, of our study were more or less similar to uh, studies done worldwide, as the, including the heart rate, the um, uh, prevalence of uh, sinus bradycardia, early repolarization, first degree AB block were some or less similar to our studies. And in another study as well, we compared the echocardiography findings, uh, which compared the echocardiographic findings in football athletes, which was also more or less similar to, as compared to our uh, study done in our center. So the study of the athlete's heart is essential, not only to understand how cardiac adaptation contributes to improve athletic performance, but also to differentiate the athlete's heart from important digit states, which may share a similar morphological study. Uh, the limitation of my study is it's a, 
the limitation of my study is it's a single center study and we could only include uh, football players in this study. We are planning to include all the other disciplines of sports as well, but due to this COVID time, we could only uh, coordinate with the ENFA and we have done uh, the uh, cardiovascular evaluation of football players. So this study provides a valuable information about cardiac condition of national level athletes of Nepal and their adaptive changes to their heart to the regular intense exercise they have been doing. This study also helps in detecting underlying heart disease that may imply a risk for sports participation and a risk of sudden cardiac death among the national level athletes of Nepal. Basically, uh, when we talk about sports cardiology, the first and foremost thing what we should know is what is the cardiac condition of our national level athletes? Do they have, uh, can they participate in the competitive sports or not? And if they can participate in the competitive, do they possess any risk of sudden cardiac death? Because uh, dying in the field of sports is the most tragic thing that you can ever imagine. So uh, me on behalf of the whole Gangalal team, I uh, have planning to initiate the sports cardiology field in Nepal so that none of our players die prematurely in the sports field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, Thank you. Rekha Timilsina, please. A casual model of promoting resilience in long-term recovery face among Nepalese elderly citizens experiencing disaster. Namaste and good afternoon, respected chair and all the delegates. It's me, Rekha Timalsina. Today, I am very much delighted to be here and to present our research findings on a causal model of promoting resilience in the long-term recovery phase among Nepalese elderly citizens experiencing disasters. I will start my presentation with background and end up my presentation with conclusion and acknowledgement. Let's move to the background. We know that globally, natural hazards have affected millions of people, killed thousands of people, and influenced the life of many people and global economy, health, and society. Simultaneously, geriatric population is increasing in trend. And they are more vulnerable to the effect of disasters However, they are resourceful. Even though their needs, challenges, and abilities are ignored to the response during the dis disasters and after the disasters. Majority of research have emphasized psychological distress and psychopathology. We know that resilience is the ability to cope with the situations caused by disasters and adjust with the future consequences to disaster. It is most important to study on resilience. There are numerous factors associated with resilience to the disasters among elderly citizens and older adult, adult populations. However, none of these studies have emphasized on the factors influencing resilience among elders experiencing disasters. In addition, there is a scarcity of robust nurse-led interventions 
resilience interventions. There are previous causal model of resilience. However, none of these models emphasize the factors influencing resilience among elders. Why was I interested to conduct studies among Nepalese elderly citizens experiencing disaster? It is because Nepal is 11th earthquake-prone country and top 20 for all the multi-hazards countries in the world. Nepalese people, along with elders, are experiencing dual threats from the impacts of both natural and infectious disease disasters. They are still experiencing more severe difficulties, and they are still staying at temporary shelters. We know that in Nepal, there is an involvement of EP nurse for the immediate assessment of the disaster victims. However, we have not emphasized the assessment in the long-term recovery phase. That's why this study aimed to develop and test a causal model of promoting resilience in the long-term recovery phase among Nepalese elderly citizens experiencing disasters. This model was developed based on meta-theory of resilience and resiliency, causal model of resilience, theories, models, qualitative meta-synthesis, meta-analysis, systematic reviews, and other empirical investigations. This is our hypothesized causal model, which have direct spirituality, self-esteem, social support, optimism, mental health, and life satisfaction has direct but positive relationship with resilience. And loneliness, perceived stress has direct and negative relationship with resilience. In addition, social support, optimism, mental health had direct but negative, indirect but negative relationship with resilience through self-efficacy. Now let's move to the research design and methodology. Path analytical cross-sectional study design was adapted and one of the earthquake affected districts from 14 heavily earthquake districts was selected for this study. Sample size was 324. Cluster stratified random sampling was adapted to select the sample and the settings. And we have one municipalities and three rural municipalities that were selected randomly from Sindhupaljuk district. These are our inclusion criteria. Based on these inclusion criteria, we have excluded 23 samples from our sampling frame. That's why we selected preceding number for our sample. These are our instrument. 11 sets of instruments that have been adapted and translated based on Borsa et al. guidelines 2012. And scale content validity index and internal consistency reliability was calculated and found acceptable. And data collection procedures, ethical approval was obtained from Nepal Health Research Council and Prince of Songkhlaeng University, Faculty of Nursing, Thailand and all the ethical procedures along with social ethics were applied during data collection. And five research assistants and one interpreters, local interpreters were trained and data were collected from research assistant and researcher by using face-to-face -face interview with their respective homes and their feasible places. Data were managed by editing, double-checked, classified and coded manually Data were entered into EP data software and analyzed into SPSS software and MO software version 24. These are the assumption tests for of multiple regression analysis, and all the assumption of multiple regression analysis was achieved. And these are other assumptions of multiple regression analysis. All the assumption of these indicators have been achieved. And these are the assumptions. It's specific to path analysis. And all these assumptions have achieved prior to path analysis. And data were analyzed using descriptive statistics, inferential statistics, and along with analysis for common method bias was done by using single factor, Harmon single factor test and found acceptable. Then the goodness of fit was calculated. Let's move to the result. We know that 58.4% of respondents were belong to 65 to 74 years of age group, where female 
and were living in joint family. And majority of respondents were Hindu, married, and illiterate, as well as majority had chronic health problems. This table reflects that 24.4% of respondents were displaced from original hometown after earthquake, 10.2% were self-injured, 17.5% and 11.6% had witness of death of their relatives, neighbors, and family members respectively. 4% and 3.3% of respondents had, had uh, witness of injury of relatives, neighbors, and family members respectively, and majority of respondents had experienced complete destruction of their house after earthquakes. This is the descriptive st statistics of explanatory and outcome variables, and these tables reflect that all the variables achieve normality assumption based on skewness and Curtis's value. This table reflects the correlation statistics and correlation statistics range from 0.14 to 0.83 and which achieved non-multicollinearity assumption. However, the researcher faced reverse beta coefficient while analyzing the data and analyzed the region and found mental health variables have correlated with multiple variables. That's why mental health variable was removed from the model. And then uh, we analyzed the data, but hypothesized causal model did not fit with the data based on the indicators. Then we modified model by adding path from perceived stress to self-efficacy. Then we achieved the model fit statistics. And this model reflect that spirituality and self-efficacy had direct relationship with resilience. Perceived stress had indirect and negative relationship with resilience. And self-esteem social support had indirect relationship with resilience through self-efficacy. And perceived stress had indirect but negative relationship with resilience through self-efficacy. This is the table that have been shown in figure already. And the conclusion hypothesized causal model of resilience did not fit with the data. Final model, modified model adding path from perceived stress to self-efficacy fitted with the empirical data. Self-efficacy, perceived stress, and spirituality had significant direct effect on resilience. And self-esteem, social support, and perceived stress had significant indirect effect on resilience. And self-efficacy is the strong and substantial variable. So that this study recommend resilience-focused intervention or services to make is should be made premediated because uh, to promote self-efficacy, self-esteem, social support, and lower the perceived stress, and to promote resilience of elders in disaster. These are my acknowledgement, and these are my some references. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rekha Timelsina. Uh, we will, uh, by the way, all speakers, please stay in the room because we'll bring you back for question answer session at the end. Our next speaker is Dr. Diptesh Aryal. Uh, the, the topic is RIMAP-CAP, a randomized embedded multifactorial adapted platform trial for coming to acquire pneumonia, anticoagulation domain. Namaste, uh, respected chairpersons and uh, delegates. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I'll be talking about uh, a clinical trial that we undertook during the COVID times in five critical care units, ICUs in Nepal. And uh, this is a global a multinational collaborative trial that we implemented across five ICUs through a critical care research group. Uh, it is a consortium of researchers, of intensivists and nurses uh, who are working to develop uh, research capacities in ICUs of Nepal. So we have a network of 12 ICUs which are working together in implementing some uh, 
uh, clinical trials. We are doing some implementation and operational research works and also some quality improvement works. So today I'll just like to share the clinical trial that we were part of and was just published and it is considered one of the practice changing clinical trials uh, in the recent times uh, when you talk about the therapeutic options in uh, COVID. So this is a remap cap. So this trial was like a initially initiated back in the times of uh, SARS and uh, H1N1. So this trial was already a platform trial, which was uh, being run across different uh, countries, mostly embedded within ICU registries. And uh, when the COVID hit us, the platform was already there. The, the research team already had the protocols, the analysis plan, and everything was right there. So. And even the potential therapeutics were shortlisted in a short time and they got the ethical approval quite uh, swiftly and, and it, this trial got into implementation in a, in a, in a very rapid manner. And uh, as like Agipani uh, you know, like uh, we in our part of the world mostly depend upon the evidence that is generated somewhere else. But what we did here, we became the part of the trial. Like, uh, we are one of the few countries who is collaborated, and uh, we took the opportunity to implement this trial in within like five ICUs of Nepal, and uh, we recruited patients from our population. So the findings of this trial are like more applicable and trans and can be translated to the clinical bedside practices, uh, and we can adapt these guidelines very easily because this is this trial results consist our population as well. And uh, to talk about the remap cap, it's got all the designs all the different. So this is the uh, this is a big uh, multinational trial. So these are the research team members from different ICUs in Nepal, and uh, five ICUs from Trivandrum University Teaching Hospital, uh, Nepal Medicity Hospital, Grandi International Hospital, Chitwan Medical College, and um, uh, Hams. ICUs were the participating sites, and uh, those are my research colleagues. Uh, so I have no competing uh, conflict of interest. And uh, so before I uh, discuss about the background of COVID, so just I'd like to share with you the design of the trial. So this is a, and this is not a conventional randomized control trial. This is a registry embedded uh, it's a randomized trial, but it was embedded and uh, embedded within the registries and part of the clinical service registries. And, and this has multifactorial, like multiple interventions were tested at the same time. And uh, a patient could be on multiple therapeutic interventions at the same time, uh, unlike the conventional uh, randomized control trials. And, and these, are these trials were designed on adaptive, uh, adaptive design. Like what does that mean is suppose when we randomize a patient and the chances of that patient getting into an arm which has a better response, like potential better response is higher. And see, Birami ko say trial ma enroll bhaiye pa ni, jun duita arm un sa ni, ramro results aira ko arm ma se porne samma ona se better un sa. And ani yo say, uh, so trial has a fixed sample size, you know? and this is your trigger reach, this is already a uh, trigger set, like superiority, inferiority, or futility. So it has a reach, and it has a result that you can publish. So in other words, I mean, it's a pragmatic trial, okay? your design, say, conventional trial, and the forex. And with, we all know that COVID has a key, surma key assume, this is a prothrombotic conditions. So what physicians did, they started prescribing therapeutic anticoagulants. They started giving therapeutic uh, dose anticoagulants. Okay? Just the heparin or say them high dose my use gantali. Because they thought that COVID is a prothrombotic stage uh, that uh, this can lead to that led to hypoxia, pulmonary embolism, by you see, rampant use on thalio. Uh, like a uh, divided okay, opinion. Say. So this was a high priority intervention. So we are part of this trial. So 
कोविड को मैं धरें पैथोफिजिओलॉजी में जाना चाहद कोविड चाहे हाई प्रोथ्रमेटिक स्टेज हो इस एंटी कोअग्लेसन कर भाई कुरा भो है अब मेथोडोलॉजी के भादा अब आई एम जस्ट टक अबाउट द रिमैप कैप तर सीमिलरली एट द सेम टाइम देर आर टू मोर ट्रायल्स एटैक रक्टिव भू टू मोर ट्रायल्स विच आर डन इन मोस्टली इन नर्थ अमेरिका अभी लास्ट में पब्लिश कर तीनटे ट्रायल मल्टीप्लेटफॉर्म संगे कंबाइन कर पब्लिश गए होना इसको स्ट्रेन्थ अज बिगर होना गए तर मल दिस ट्रायल्स हेज सीमिलर डिजाइन्स अक उ डेटा डेटा सेट देखि लेकर प्रोटोकल्स लाइक मोनिटरिंग मेकानिजम डीएसएमबी अल वेर अल अल वेर इंटिग्रेटेड इसलिए काम करना सजी पब्लिश करना सजी भ अब इसमें के गए भाई सो डिजाइन तो मैं भनी सके अब कस्तो पेसेंट इन्क्लूड करो भादा दोज पेसेंट्स आईसी में दुई किसिम के पेसेंटर थे क्या तेरे एवं क्रिटिकली इल दोज पेसेंट्स हू रिक्वायर्ड अर्गन सपोर्ट वेन्टिटर डायलाइसि चाहिए रखो अर्क पेसेंट्स हू वर मोडरेटली इल दे वर नट अन अर्गन सपोर्ट सो वी डिड थेरापिटिक एंटी कोअग्लेसन वर्स इज यूजुअल केयर That was defined as per the ICU protocol or discretion of the physician. I know you got it. And all the safety zone precautions are there. About you, sir. We have to locally implement. Got it. Only I am like your learning experience. But you, sir, we did quite well. And so about conventional zone, about exclusion criteria, or some screening. Got it. Like written informed consent. All the ethical processes were completed. अंत्य सब करे अंडर स्टार्टेड दिस ट्रायल एंड पॉइंट्स तो के थी भादा इसको सर्वाइवल अथवा मोर्टालिटी मत थे दोज आर द कन्वेन्सनल एंड पॉइंट्स है यह ट्रायल में एंड पॉइंट्स के थी भादा अर्गन सपोर्ट फ्री डेज ड्यूरिंग द स्टे आईसी और हस्पिटल स्टे अर्गन सपोर्ट फ्री डेज कति भो तो हे अर्क सेकेंडरी आउटकम अर्क थी लाइक यो रिस्क अफ ह्यूमोरेज इंसिडेन्स अफ ह्यूमोरेज अरु एंड पॉइंट्स मेजर ब्लिडिंग तिन्नी हे थो है रे देखिए एंड दिस दिस टेबल जस्ट सोज द नंबर अफ रिक्रुटमेंट्स दैट हेव बीन डन अक्रस डिफ्रेंट साइट्स इन नेपाल यो पर्टिकुलर डोमेन चाहिए जो अभी मैं भाई थे तो डोमेन अभी क्लोज भैस क्योंकि रिजल्ट्स आर आउट वे आर स्टिल डुइंग कंटिन्ुएसन अफ द सेम ट्रायल इंटरमिडिएट वर्स इज यूजुअल केयर को कंटिन्ू भैर एंड देर आर मोर टू टू मोर डोमेन्स एट भाइटामिन सी टेस्ट कर रहा सौ यही को कोविड र नन कोविड दुईटे में एस्पिरिन गये तेस को रिजल्ट रिसेंटली पब्लिश पाक थी सीम्बाई स्टैटिन हमें करना पाएन क्योंकि यहाँ एवेलेबल रहें रहे अभी आइवर मेक्टिन चाहे हम भर्खर अब सुरू कर लगा मेन फाइंडिंग मे भाँचु भादा अभी जो मैं नन क्रिटिकल इल पेसेंट भाई थे नन क्रिटिकल इल पेसेंट में थेरापिटिक एंटी कोअग्लेसन कर सपोर्ट फ्री डेज वॉज बेटर compared to the usual care and there were no much, not much significant difference in terms of uh, side effects hemorrhages are just khase farak dekhiyena when you see moderately ill patient those patients who are not on ventilators not on cardiovascular supports not on hemodialysis did better but unfortunately ke dekhiyo bhanda heri critical ill patient ma garda kheri chai those patients who are on ventilators who are on high flow oxygen cannulas who are on dialysis or vasopressors unar lai therapeutic anticoagulation ma chai unar ko organs uh, support free days pani worse dekhiyo this uh, to uh, major bleeding ko incidence pani badi dekhiyo and it was proven jun statistical method use gare tele chai yo chai inferior dekhiyo ke and futile pani dekhiyo bhanu ko artha chai jun suru ma hamle gareka thyau empirically tyo chai wrong proof bhayo yo yo trial ko aadhar ma chai tesaile aba yo dui ta लाइक कंट्रास्टिंग आउटकम छो भाई अज सेकेंडरी एनालाइसिश भैर है टेक होम मेसेज के भादा खेल इन क्रिटिकली इल कोविड पेसेंट्स एज पर दिस ट्रायल द थेरापिटिक एंटी कोअग्लेसन डज वर्स टू द पेसेंट्स इट इट डज मोर हार्म टू द पेसेंट्स दैन लाइक दैन हेल्प द पे पेसेंट्स टू रिकवर जिस आफ्टर दिस ट्रायल Uh, the clinicians have like how many keep on here on the translation to the bedside practice so these icus and the other icus within the network have now adapted to intermediate dosing for critically ill patients within trial or outside trial of a therapeutic dosing chai gardainan so so this was translated back to the clinical practice so that's was that's just uh, 
uh, my experience of implementing this trial in Nepal and contributing to generating evidence that's going to benefit the global population. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Diptesh. Uh, next presenter is Dhiraj Sreshta. Dhiraj Sreshta, please come forward. The topic is carbapenemase encoding black APC and black OXA48 genes in uh, carbapenem resistant gram negative bacteria in a tertiary care center, uh, tertiary hospital in Nepal. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer team to give me opportunity to be the part of this event. Respected chair, panelists, guests, fellow presenter, and participant. I'm Dhiraj Shrestha, and I'm here today to present uh, one research work on surveillance of carbapenemic encoding black APC and black support yet. Here is the list of my co-authors. And this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, for, let's start with background. Uh, first, uh, antimicrobial resistance uh, is the global public health uh, threat uh, to health security. Uh, in 2019, it is estimated that 1.27 million deaths were attributed to AMR, and this figure is estimated to rise up to 10 million by 2050, and thus AMR is leading us to uh, post-antibiotic era, the era where uh, we will die of uh, common infection due to lack of uh, antibiotic. And the uh, AMR is a natural ge genetic phenomena, uh, so it is continually uh, evolving and expanding, so it cannot be stopped. And for the EMDR uh, gram-negative bacteria, uh, carbapenem has always uh, still been the last research treatment, but in recent years, uh, gram-negative bacteria has uh, been producing carbapenemase enzyme and this is creating health problem. Uh, Carbapenemase was first identified in 1993, and recently WHO has enlist, enlisted uh, carbapenem resistance as in bacter, uh, pseudomonas, and interbacteria in top tier priority pathogen to focus uh, R&D of new anti antibiotic. And carbapenem resistance in gram-negative bacteria is high in South Asia. Uh, we can say South Asia is the epicenter, but the data is very is sparse. And with this premise, uh, we conceptualize this research to, sur uh, to do surveillance of uh, carbapenem resistant gram-negative bacteria and two, of, uh, two carbapenem encoding genes. And here is the methodology. Uh, first, we did the uh, descriptive cross-sectional study at Grandi Hospital in 2018, and the total sample was uh, 4,919. And here is the laboratory procedure. First, we cultured the sample, isolated the bacteria, and identified, and did uh, antibiotic susceptibility test, test, and interpreted by CLSI 2017. And we did modify the ORC test for phenotypic characterization of carbapenemase. And uh, we characterized uh, black APC and black supported gene by PCR at Onabunda Research Center. And here is the result. Uh, of the total uh, sample, uh, we only found 186 carbapenem resistant gram negative bacteria, of which only 42 were uh, MSD positive. And only 29 isolates had uh, the gene, and 11 isolates had both of the gene. And in, anti in, uh, in susceptibility testing, uh, cholestine and tetrasligine were the effective in interbacteria. Similarly, cholestine was uh, most effective in pseudomonas, and cholestine and tetracycline was effective in uh, as in nitrobacter bomani. 
and we can see here uh, uh, cleft cell and urinary uh, isolates uh, have higher number of carbapenem resistance, MST, black APC, black SA. And assignative factor and uh, cleft cell and uh, have the higher percentage of MDR, XDR and possibly few PDR. And here is the limitation of our study. First of all, it was a single center study for six months with the small sample size of uh, around 5,000. And another limitation was after we conducted this uh, research, the modified Hawk test which we used for the phenotypic characterization was archived by CLSI in 2018. So uh, CLSI do, do not endorse these methods now. And another limitation was uh, we did not perform genotyping of all um, meropenem susceptible isolates. And with financial cost constraint, uh, not all carbapenem encoding genes were genotyped. And in conclusion, <coughs> sorry, and in conclusion, we, uh, we found that cholesterol and tetracycline can be the drug of choice for carbapenem resistant gram-negative bacteria and black oxa, uh, 48 and black APC both were higher in gram-negative bacteria and this warrants the effective antimicrobial stewardship approaches to be conducted. Uh, before I wrap up, uh, I would like to say that uh, people, we people do not talk about AMR. Most of the people talk about politics, few talks about climate change, but I have heard none topic talking about AMR. This, this is the time which we are already late to talk about AMR. In the crux of this AMR can be highlighted by the fact that uh, the AMR is only the second topic to be discussed in the WHO General Assembly. So, uh, WHO has already formulated the global action plan and we are fortunate that Nepal had already also formulated national action plan. But after that, we see that means we, we haven't done anything. So, it is now we sh time that we should talk about this issue. And I haven't found any uh, public media or public, in any public forum, beside this health forum, so, uh, people talk about AMR. Only few topics are being raised by uh, media outlets and I'm, I was happy that yesterday, uh, Kantipur, uh, sorry, Annapurna Delhi has covered a huge story in the front page about this AMR. So, I request all to let's talk about AMR and let's fight AMR. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dheeraj Shrestha. Next speaker is, instead of uh, Dipendra Thapa, uh, Ved Prakash Sharma is presenting the next uh, uh, research. It's uh, neglected tropical medicine, I'm sorry, neglected tropical diseases, NTDs, services availability at local health facilities in eastern Nepal. Uh, Respected chairs and uh, panelists, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm overwhelmed by this uh, opportunity. Uh, uh, so, what's the presentation? Can I get the presentation? Okay. Uh, with your permission, I'd like to start the presentation. Uh, uh, first of all, let me alert Yala uh, Bonum. As a topic, neglected tropical diseases, it has nothing to do with clinical research. So, this is a neglected tropical disease. Neglected is not neglected. Basically, your research is in health system or health accessibility. Uh, you 
सेशन तीर फैलि तेल नेग्लेक्टेड बन गए नेग्लेक्ट ट्रपिल डिजिज सर्विस एबिलिटी एंड लोकल हेल्थ फैसिलिटीज इन ईस्टर्न नेपाल हमें एटा स्टडी थे में हम इन्वेस्टिगेटर दीपेन्द्र काजी थासैगरी हर्षराज दाहाल चिरंजीवी नेपाल भुवन बराल जनक था एंजनल कार्की निर्मला शर्मा डम्बर सिंह गुरु रिशेल क्लेरई भर जी हम चार संस्था पीएचआरडी नेपाल सिक्कि यूनिवर्सिटी अस्ट्रेलिया नेफा रेयरमेट फाउंडेशन को सहकार में भग स्टोरी ओके सो नेग्लेक्टेड ट्रपिकल डिजिज विश्व स्वास्थ्य संगठन ने जब बीसवटा डिजिज राखे में इसमें दसवटा डिजिज तेस में लेप्रोसि लिंबेटिक फाइरेरियासि लिस्मिनियासि डेंगी रेबिज स्नेक बाइट अथवा स्नेक एनवेनमिंग सोइल ट्रांसमिटर हेलमिट स्के स्केबिज टिनियासि रेकोमा विशेषगरी इसलिए इस नेग्लेक्टेड भाई कारण विशेषकर एकदम गरीब हाउस होल्ड में जहाँ वाटर क्वालिटी तेगरी लिविंग स्टैंड सैनिटेसन रक्सेस टू हेल्थ केयर सब स्टैंडर्ड भाई रोग बड़ी भाग बड़ी पाइज विश्व में एक बिलियन पीपल कुने न कुने एंटिटी बड़ इफेक्ट भैन में लगभग सब ठाँ में चाह अलमोस्ट अल पपुलेसन कुने एवटा न एटा एंटिटी को रिस्क में रहोक फैक्टर पाइज तर ते भाभ ट्रपिकल भित्ति गर्मी धीरे ह्यूमिड ठाव में पाने भाग ने साउदर्न प्लेन्स तराई में यो डिजिज बड़ी मात्रा में पाइज रही हम ईस्टर्न भाई प्रोविंस वन को कुरास में झापा मोरंग सुनसरी तीन टा तराई का जिला इसको बर्डन एकदम हाई पाइ रही बर्डन लम कर सपोर्ट करना फेयरमेड फाउंडेशन संस्था ने विश्वास परियोजना भर तैं लंच ताकि एंटिटी एफेक्टेड इंडिविजुअल को हेल्थ और वेलबिइंग में तेल इंप्रूव कर सकोस् रो को लगी एटा अर्ली डायग्नोसिस ट्रिटमेंट एप्रोच गयो डिजिज प्रोग्रेसन में कई मदद कर सकता भिस्ब से यह प्रोजेक्ट लंच कर हमें धेरे कंपोनेंट हर थे बेसलाइन स्टडी में रेस तो मध्य सर्विस एक्सेसिबिलिटी भी हमें इसमें हेरे थे स पड़ी अब इसको दुईटा उद्देश्य अगि ना मैं भाई एटा सर्विस एभलेबिलिटी हेने रेडिनेस नेग्लेक्टेड ट्रपिकल डिज को सर्विस दिन लेडिनेस कस्त हेन खोजे थे इसमें मेजर एंटिटी जो हाई बर्डन भैया लेप्रोसि लिंबेटिक फाइरेरियासि लिस्मिनासि रेबिज को केस में हेरि थे अर्क कैपेसिटी बिल्डिंग निड हम आप इंटरभेन्सन करने कस्ट कैपेसिटी बिल्डिंग निड्स चाहिए थी वह हमें हेन खोजे थे इस एकदम सीम्पल एकदम सीम्पल स्टडी क्रस सेक्शनल फैसिलिटी बेस्ड सर्वे थी हेल्प पोस्ट रीएससी सीम में तैंक स्टाफ हमें सोधे थे हमें तैने पच्चीसवटा हाई बर्डेन उस में प्रोजेक्ट लंच कर तीमदे बाहरवटा रैंडमली सिलेक्ट करा थे रहा भैया सब हेल्थ फैसिलिटी का इंचार्ज न भाई कोई सीनियर हेल्थ वर्कर्स हमें इंटरव्यू को वो कलेक्ट सफ्टवेयर बड़ चाह सर्वे चेकलिस्ट को मध्यम इंटरव्यू लिखे डाटा कलेक्शन कर इसमें डब्ल्यूएचओ को सर्विस प्रोविजन एंड रेडिनेस एसेसमेंट फ्रेमवर्क कर तीन टा कुछ डाइंस ट्रिटमेंट फैसिलिटी ट्रिटमेंट सर्विसेस अफ लेप्रोसि लिस्मिनासि फाइलेरियासि को हेरा थे तेगरी एंटी रेबिज भैक्सिन को एभलेबिलिटी रेसगरी नेशनल गाइडलाइन को यूज हेरा थे एनालाइस एकदम सीम्पल छ डिस्क्रिप्टी रिक्वेन्सी में मत हे अभियली एनएचआरसी एप्रुवल लिने रेस पचाड़ी रिटर्न कंसेंट भी पक्के अभियली लिखेक थी अब रिजल्ट को हमें सब में हेखे ये सुरू में हेल्थ वर्कर ने कति लिखा रहे एंटीडी में ट्रेनिंग भादा खेल लेप्रोसि में सब भाग बड़ी पाइयो फाइलेरियासि ट्रको में रेबिज में एकजा स्टाफ ने एकजा हेल्थ वर्कर ने कुने किसिम को आसम तालीम नपा देखिए यो हेल्थ पोस्ट रीएचसी से हई फिर अब इस फिर मैं ध्यान आकर्षण करें पाड़ी ठीक है सब तालीम नपा सकस तर कमती में हेल्थ फैसिलिटी एट हेल्थ फैसिल एवटा तो होने पर्च नहीं कति पर्सेंट में एवटा न एवटा लिखा रही एटलिस्ट एकजा स्टाफ से ट्रेन रही भादा खेल फेर भी लेप्रोसि में सेवेन्टी टू पर्सेंट हेल्थ फैसिलिटी लेप्रोसि में ट्रेन देखियो रेस पाड़ी ट्वेंटी टू में लिंबेटिक फाइनेस ट्रेन देखियो अरुण सब दस पर्सेंट 
दस पर्सेंट हेल्थ फेसिलिटी अथवा सो भाग कम हेल्थ फेसिलिटी मत तो ट्रेंड अरु अरु एंटिटी में ट्रेंड मानी पाइए सर्विस को हिसाब में गाँव फेरी, फेरी पनि हेखे लेप्रोसी कंसिस्टेंट सर डाटा चाहे लेप्रोसी को हेखे लगभग लगभग एटी वन पर्सेंट में एवटा न एटा कुछ सर्विस या तो ट्रिटमेंट या तो डायग्नोसि अथवा बोथ गाँव एटी वन पर्सेंट में देखिए तेस में हेद्दे थर्टी थ्री पर्सेंट ले बोथ डायग्नोसि करें ट्रिटमेंट भी करने एट एट पर्सेंट ले ट्रिट डायग्नोसि मत करने झंडे फोर्टी पर्सेंट ले ट्रिटमेंट सेवा दी रहे इसमें हे लिस्मिनियास में तीनटा मत यो संस्था जल्द से डायग्नोसि ट्रिटमेंट दुईटे कर एकल सर्विस दिने को छेन फाइल एरिया में हे एकदम नेग्लिजिबल एटी नाइन पर्सेंट हेल्थ फेसिलिटी में कुने पर सेवा छे रगबाइट को हिसाब में नाइन्टी फोर पर्सेंट में कुने पर सेवा उपलब्ध छेन फाइव पॉइंट सिक्स में दुईटा थर्टी सिक्स में दुईटा हेल्थ फेसिलिटी में रेबिज भैक्सिन से एभालेबल देखिए ते पाड़ी हमें सोद के हो तो तब सेवा दिन बारियर के हो के कुछ तब अड़काइर भाग वहाँ को जवाब के एटा ट्रेन मेन पावर छाइन हमीस ट्रेन ह्यूमन रिशोर्स छे अर्क इक्विपमेंट लजिस्टिक नहीं नए पे हमें सेवा दिन सकें भो अर्क लैबोरेटरी फैसिलिटी डायग्नोस्टिक सर्विस हमीस छेन भाई अर्क थे रस्ट में मेडिशिन हमी सेवा दिन सकने वाले मेडिशिन को अभाव हम यहाँ सेवा दिन न सकने अवस्थ में छो भाई बेरियर को रूप में वहाँ देखा भाथ अब कंक्लूजन एकदम अबियस कंक्लूजन केस धे बर्डन हाई स लब लब सब एंटिटी को कुने न कुछ एंटिटी देखि सब एंटिटी देखि ये तीन टा जिला में तर हेखे लेप्रोसी को अलग बड़ी फोकस भर तेरह सर्विस गई रहोक देखि अन्न डिजिज को हक में एकदम न्यून अगि भी हरिहाल बीस पर्सेंट अथवा अरु फाइल एरिया बीस पर्सेंट छा अरु तो दस पर्सेंट अथवा तो भाग कम जीरो पर्सेंटसम देखे हाई बर्डेन छ सर्विस छेन तैंक मेन पावर ट्रेन कर कैपेसिटी बिल्डिंग कर डाइग्नोस्टिक इक्विपमेंट हु मेडिशन सप्लाई कर रिशेषरी क्वालिटी सर्विस प्रमोट करना का नेशनल प्रोटोकल स्टैंडर्ड प्रोटोकल नेशनल गाइडलाइन तेस को यूज प्रमोट करना कन्क्लूजन इसको सजेसन रिकमेंडेसन कन्क्लूजन जी भाई लिमिटेसन को लो सैंपल साइज जब छत्तीसवटा हेल्थ फैसिलिटी थी तर छत्तीसवटा भन्ना मोर देन वन थर्ड अफ अल हेल्थ फैसिलिटीज इन दिस थ्री डिस्ट्रिक्स हो तेज कम भी भन्न तो मिले बट स्टिल थर्टी सिक्स इज ए स्मल नंबर तेगरी सर्विस एबिलिटी हे हमें बारियर में हे तर तब क्या सर्विस भाग वहाँ में हमें लज इक्विपमेंट मेडिशिन लजिस्टिक कि छेन तो अब्जर्वेसन से नगर भर भी एट लिमिटेसन से हमें इसमें हेरे अर्क सर्विस प्रोविजन बाई नेशनल गाइडलाइन जस्तु कुने गाइडलाइन ने रेबिज को सर्विस हेल्पस में न होना भर लेखक होता तर हमें तेल नहेरिकन क्योंकि पालिका लेवल ने भी धेरे स्थानीय तह में गई रखे भर तो सब हेरे भर नेशनल गाइडलाइन को एक्जैक्ट रिफ्लेक्स हमेशन आर में थे हम स्टडी को लिमिटेसन थी लास्ट में अब थैंक यू टाइम रो थैंक यू टाइम रहो थैंक यू भी दी भाई थे मैं पार्टिशिपेंट अफकोर्स सब दी सब टीम मेम्बर रविज वन को पीएचडी हेल्थ अफिश तीनटे जिला को हेल्थ अफिश रामला फंडिंग करने होने सपोर्ट करने होने फेयरमेट स्विजरलैंड मैं धन्यवाद दिन चाहे हस्त थैंक यू नमस्कार Thank you, Beth Prakash. Uh, stay in the podium on the podium. Uh, please, all speakers, come back to the podium. A picture: Riju, Rekha, Diptesh, and Diraj. Please come back for question, uh, quick question answer. Maybe a few questions. If there are any questions from the audience, please raise your hand, and the mic will be provided. Let me just ask a quick question to: Is Diraj here? To Diraj uh, uh, regarding the uh, these Oxa uh, 48. Carbapenemase producing bacteria. Uh, you can come to the podium up here so that you can take the microphone and answer the question. Uh, so, uh, what uh, I, I see that you said cholestine and tetracycline susceptibility was higher. I was wondering. I mean, tetracycline is a broad class of antibody. Which antibody did you test? Because tetracycline being uh, active against gram negative is a little bit, you know, not very uh, appetizable. <laughs> appetizable. Uh, so, uh, what, 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 which um, Tetracycline, did you test for? Maybe you want to clarify that. 
Pardon, sir, I did not understand the question. Oxa, you know, the carbapenemis producing bacteria was, uh, you presented that, right? So, it w they were resi less resistant or more susceptible to cholestine and tetracyclines, you said. So, which tetracycline did you test? Which tetracycline did you check for? <coughs> Commercial tetracycline, we commercially available. Dicks, how is sir? Tetracycline test very out. Other. Tetracycline susceptible, sir. As far as I know, you probably, I don't know if you did or somebody else, it was probably tiger cycling. Because tiger cycling has more broader activity, Ayin, including. Ayin, sir, commercially available dicks, sir. Tetracycline. I mean, yeah, sir. Dicks, sir. No, that's what I'm trying to say. Doxycycline, tetracyclines are not very active against gram negatives, but it yes. might be tiger cycling. So you have to be more specific than the saying tetracyclines. Yes, okay. okay, thank you. And any, any other question from the audience? Others will wrap up the session. So uh, if any questions to the speakers, please. Uh, is there any questions? And there are two committed panelists here. And uh, so if there is any questions to those two panelists also, please. One question, two questions, please. Okay. Please, gentlemen, please. Namaskar. I am Dammar Singh Guru. Fairmate Foundation. I am a participant. I am a representative of Rekha Tim Sina. I am a presentation. I am a spiritual one. This quality elaborate garden of heaven. You couldn't send the to spiritual one of Hosnubago. You know, in Sintapaz of Malikati, Kura, Rupin Agati, spiritual, you book on Bokabelama, this come to K, Linkist, this hockey, other K, Saki Malik, the business agate. Thank you. Hazur Danibas, sir, a Mone Palibate, Uther Dinazahe, Hazur Kukushin Kulagi, spirituality, Mase, Mile Underwood, two thousand two co. Uh, daily spirituality experiences scale use kar rahe the. Ani tyo scale ma chahi 16 ota items saru thiyo. 16 ota items mani six points like ota items saru thiye. Ani tis ma chahi wale ab daily wale afno life life sustain garna ko lagi chahi. Kosto kosto hal ko activities or perform garna uncha. Tis ma chahi especially God lai or supernatural power lai chahi address gare ra question saru thiyo. Tis ma yota question ma ma le address garna chahi. Is ma just to ma le Bhagwan lai samjha da khiri pani ma mero atma lai chahi shanti ananda mahasus garchu. Bandra wahar le ma le sodhi ko prashna ma chahi wahar le sandhe cha sune tiyo Feeling Rahnu Unsaki, Koilika Rahnu Unsaki, Bonne Kurako, response ko Adhar Mase, Mali spirituality dimension like Major Goriko Thi, Ani two major Goriko dimension ma, Bohami, Nepal, Boniko, a spiritual country ne Boyo, I know, this Kulagi say, spirituality dimension, Euta most direct relationship with resilience, Boko variables group mapani, Dekio. त्यो मैले चाहेर भन्दा पनि उहाँहरुले दिएको रेस्पोन्स को आधारमा देखियो र अब हामीले पनि हाम्रो एल्डर्सहरुलाई चाहिँ स्पिरिचुअलिटी फोकस्ड इन्टरभेन्सनहरु गरेर नॉट ओन्ली डिजास्टर अरु सिचुएसनमा पनि हामीले उहाँहरुको रेसिलियन्सलाई चाहिँ डेभलप गर्न सक्छौ भन्ने चाहिँ मेरो अनुसन्धानबाट निष्कर्ष निस्केको छ धन्यवाद Hi, um, I have a question for Dr. Ariel, Diptesh Ariel. I, uh, I'm actually a pediatric intensivist. Um, I'm not adult, but um, there must be some, some confounding variables why the uh, critically ill patients actually died or uh, uh, you know, had ad adverse events, or actually required more organ support when they were on uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. That's one question. The second question is, in your practice, since the moderately ill patients actually um, did not have side effects from the therapeutic anticoagulation, are you using those in the moderate patients or just the prophylactic anticoagulation? 
thank you. Thank you for your <coughs> great questions. So, uh, presumably, our jun chay our possible reason or there is speculation chay baas. Definitive reason kina paayo bani kura chay. As a secondary analysis or by us, other do it a reason say distinct the kinsa. You're a sign COVID co stays ma that is severe on the exams and that is irreversibility on the reason like the thrombotic changes are funny and tell you that it behaves like DIC just to unsa keep on me can a more bleeding when they can a on a oxygen of an improved no one even if it's a thrombolytic effect has a bina to okay when you are a presumption so अब और कुछ नहीं मॉडरेट मतलब क्या रही सांड है रे हेपरिन को से तीन टाइप इफेक्ट होने से योर एंटी इन्फ्लेमेटरी होने से अब एंटी कोआगलेशन तो बाया लियो और को एंटी वायरल इफेक्ट पनी होने से अंची अर्ली मॉडरेट डिजीज़ होने को डिजीज़ को अर्ली फेज में बाहों ना ले ये सब एक कुरा को से कॉम्बिनेशन Moderately ill, we are using therapeutic anticoagulation. Critically ill, I mean, if this thing is in trial, we are using intermediate. Otherwise, it's up to the physicians to decide. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your patience hearing. And here we conclude the session. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Chair. Uh, we are at the verge of ending this session. So, uh, thank you, uh, presenters, for your extraordinary presentations. Thank you, uh, participants, for your active participation and uh, bearing out with us. So, moving on, uh, may I take this opportunity to request our chairs to provide a token of appreciation uh, to our invited speaker, Professor Dr. Mohan Raj Sarma. I humbly request Professor Sarma to receive our gratitude. Likewise, we'd like to reinforce our gratitude with a small token of appreciation to our panelists, Dr. Avinav Baidya and Dr. Prabhat Adhikari. Thank you, sir. Correspondingly, to provide token of appreciation to our chairs for their profound contributions to this session, I take this privilege to invite prominent scholar of Nepal, Professor Dr. Jeevan Bahadur Sechan, our former EIB chair and uh, receiver of Lifetime Achievement Award of NHRC last year. So last but not the least, I'd like to invite our presenters, presenters for the day to the dais to receive the token of appreciation from our chairs. I'd like to first invite Dr. Apeksha Nyuralawa. I'd like to invite Rizu Manander, Dr. Rizu Manander. Similarly, Rekha Timalsina. Sina. 
Dr. Deepthe Soryal. Thank you, sir. Dr. Dheera Shrestha. Correspondingly, may I invite Beth Prakash Sarma to the dais for receiving the token of appreciation. Thank you. So with this, we declare the end of this session. Thank you, Professor Sertson, for being with us. Uh, and we would like to thank you all for your invaluable presence that has been added values to us in this session. Now I'd like to hand over to my colleagues for initiating the next session entitled Biomedical Epidemiological and Clinical Research Part 2. Thank you. Have a good day ahead. Hello, am I audible? Sundra, sir. Namaste, good afternoon, and warm welcome. I'm Unima Sapkota, Resource Officer at Nepal Health Research Council, and I'm your host for this session. We are at the day two of the 8th National Summit of Health and Population Scientists in Nepal. I hope you all are having a good time here at the summit. We are at the session four of the summit named Biomedical, Epidemiological and Clinical Research. This is the second part of the session. The first part has already been covered. I hope and I expect that you will enjoy this part as much as you enjoyed the first part. In this session, we have a total of eight presentations and one invited talk on the area of biomedical, epidemiological and clinical research. The time duration for each presentation is 10 minutes, so I request all our presenters to finish the presentation on time. Our audiences will be able to ask any questions and queries which will be addressed at the end of the session. To chair the session, we have our respected Dr. Sam Sundayadav and our respected Professor Dr. Prakash Kimire. It is our privilege to have such distinguished chairs to chair the session. I would like to take this opportunity to give a brief introduction of our chairs, starting with Dr. Sam Sundar Yadav. Dr. Yadav is a chief consultant at the Ministry of Health and Population. He has been working in the medical fraternity for almost three decades now. He has received several government awards, such as the Flood Strikon Special Award. He has published several research papers on national and international journals. Similarly, moving forward to introducing Professor Dr. Prakash Ghimire. Professor Dr. Ghimire is a professor of microbiology at the Trivon University with more than 25 years of infectious disease and research experience. He is an active member of the World Health Organization advisory group on various sectors. He was also a member of the COVID-19 vaccine research and development he has published more than 140 research papers on the area of infectious disease and global ethics. It is our pleasure and our real fortune to have our chairs with us. Let us welcome both our chairs again with a huge round of applause. Similarly, I would like to welcome our presenters on the stage to take their respective seats. I would like to welcome Ms. Uma Kafle on the stage, Mr. Rajendra Gautam, Ms. Mandira Adhikari, 
मिस्टर प्रमोद कुमार मेहता डॉक्टर विवेचन था डॉक्टर विवेक राज भंडारी मिस्टर तर्क था डॉक्टर ली बुढ़ाथोकी एंड मिस सीला था I'd like to welcome all the presenters on the stage. Without any delay, I would like to hand over the stage to our chairs to start the formal session of the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yunima ji. Uh, without wasting the time, let's try to move to the first presenter, which is to be presented by Ms. Uma Kafle on Nepal's population-based cancer registry, key findings. Ms. Kafle, your time is 10 minutes, please. Respected chairs and uh, all presenters and health and public health professional and all my dear respected junior and senior sisters and sirs and madam. Today, my is Amro. Today, my name is Uma Kafle. My is conference ma at the national summit ma present gan mau ka din boy kumna sab. Sarva pratham ta Nepal Health Sisters Council summit committee member or life team lai der der dhanne baad din chahanchu. Ra aaj mai le present gan lagi ko report or program maner bande hari Nepal Health Sisters Council le 2018 dehi gar dey aayi rahe ko program ho. Ra isma hamre aayi le 2018 ko findings ta hamle poyle ne present gari kathi ho. Ra 2019 ko finding ke cost dekhi ko cha bande ko raje mai isma present gan gari rahe ko chhu. हम रे इस पॉपुलेशन बेस कैंसर रजिस्ट्री को स्टडी टीम में उन्होंने जो डॉक्टर पौर्दीप गेमाली, डॉक्टर मेंगनाथ दीमाल, डॉक्टर बिहान गंभीरता, रम्मा आफे उमा काफले मिस कोपिला खड़का, मिस सिताशनु दाहल, मनीष दकाल, किरण नेवपाने, मिस सुरज कुमार मंडल और सारी ना ग्यामाली उन्नजा। रेस आज आपको मेरे प्रेजेंटेशन का आउटलाइन मैंने कुछ इंट्रोडक्शन बैकग्राउंड ऑफ कैंसर रजिस्ट्री, प्रोग्राम ओवरव्यू ऑफ पीबीसीआर नेपाल, इलिजिबिलिटी क्राइटेरिया फॉर द रजिस्ट्रेशन ऑफ द कैंसर केसेस इन नेपाल, मेथोडोलॉजिकल फैमर्स, प्राइमरी सोर्सेस ऑफ द पीबीसीआर डाटा, पीबीसीआर फाइंडिंग्स ऑफ ट्वेंट रा सर्व प्रथम मानव प्रदा आमिलाई ये आज ये समिट मापने ही जो देखिए आज सम्मा आमदा हरी विभिन्न किस्म का एनसीडी संबंधी रिलेटेड रिसोर्स और प्रेजेंट बाई रहे कुछ हर तेज में आमिला आओगत ने कराई है कुछ कि नेपाल में अथवा बिस्सो में एनसीडी को जून प्रकोप देर दिन एवरी ईयर बढ़ते गई रहे कुछ तेज में 